start with via Zoom. I'm going to call the meeting to order. First agenda item is uh, select board issues and concerns. Yeah, I'd like to add at some point, I'd like to talk about the email we got from uh, Kyle News. Do you want to add as an item or just discuss it under issues and Either concerns? Either way. I think it'd be fine under issues and concerns, but we can add it as an item if there's no other concerns. I've got a couple. They can probably fit in under <coughs> some of these existing agenda items, but we had we had said at one point that we were going to get on the agenda uh, the letter from Dixie Mays uh, regarding some historical society issues and. He won't be here later, but I think Mary Jean and some others might be. So they have I don't think a, want to deal with that. They mm -hmm. have a spot for a report. Yeah. So I think they can handle that pretty good. Um, and uh, under the same category, I have officially submitted my resignation. Issue debt cap with regard to appointing members. And then when we talk about either the cemeteries or the plot cemetery, I've got Mark, do you have any issues or concerns? No, I'm peaceful. Beth? All good here, thank you. Eric, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's much anticipated attack. Uh, um, sorry, sorry, Eric. Uh, Brian, can you mute everybody and not allow them to unmute? I know she said something, but I don't have a clue what it was. Um, the Zoom, so folks have control of muting and unmuting, and I that's already problematic. Um, so I was asking if Brian could please restrict ability to mute and unmute. Thank you. Sorry, Eric. Eric, would you like to continue? Okay. Um, as I say, you got an email, all board members from Kyle. Uh, and as such, sending it to all board members, it is now a uh, public document. But I'd like to read just the last paragraph. That's an area that I have some concerns with. This is an email from Kyle. I can't respectfully encourage you enough to really think hard about the long-term compounding effects, adding more roads like Plot Road with no enforcement will have on our community. Is it worth a few extra gas and sandwich sales at a multi-million dollar franchise? And when I say enforcement, having the club's buddy be promoted to this position of power should be a hard no for so many obvious reasons. That's not enforcement. That's strategic toxic cronyism that Johnson's leadership needs to take a hard stance against. And then she respectfully signed it. I support and have always supported any member of the public who wants to send a note advocating for or against a position that the select board may be taking or has taken. What I have trouble with is the allegation that one of our appointees, and I'm guessing it was our constable because I recall that we had a constable here that night. Um, whether this constable is a buddy or not with a club member, I don't know that, but insinuating that they would uh, play favoritism if we chose to use the constables as an enforcement officer. Uh, that's a decision we haven't even made yet. And if there was any evidence of any wrongdoing by any of our appointees or employee, employees, 
you know, I would hope that that evidence would be brought to this board and we would deal with it as appropriate. But to make an accusation or insinuate that one of our appointees would do something just by them being appointed, that's very troubling to me because all of our employees and our appointees have family and friends in this community. And to say that they would play favoritism, to the best of my knowledge, all of our employees and employees do not do that. And if they there is a conflict of interest, they will recuse themselves. So what I would like to, to see is it going on the record that uh, we support our appointees and employees. And therefore, I would like to make a motion that the select board thanks our employees for their service, their commitment, their dedication, and uh, we support them and for their uh, contributions to the community. That's my motion, and I'd just like it public on the public record. Um, a friendly amendment that it be our volunteers, appointees, and employees. Uh, do we need a second to? Uh, second. Okay, there's With a, a friendly amendment. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, yes. what's your friendly amendment? <laughs> to expand your motion, expand it from employees to employees, appointees, and volunteers. Yes, yes, I would go there. That's uh, amendment, friend, friendly second, amendment. Yeah. Have you communicated with her that this, we haven't even made this decision? About the constable being in charge of enforcement? No, I haven't spoken with her and we have yeah. not made the decision. Right, and we haven't, yeah. That would be interesting for uh, basing this on some assumption that is incorrect. There's a motion. Just, the concern I have is it is a public document now. Once it was sent out, select board members. And I just would like to be on the record as saying that I support our employees and employees and volunteers, and volunteers uh, because I think they're all a good, hard working bunch of upstanding. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I think we've covered it. All those in favor, sig signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you for that, Eric. Thank you. It's uh, important to support employees, appointees, and volunteers. For sure. Uh, next item up is reviewing invoices. I'm doing it tonight as Beth is out. Um, I'm going to read the non common invoices and total amounts. And if there's questions, we could break it down line by line. Uh, Brussels fuels uh, totaling $6,314.74. That's split up between the town garage, mill house, town diesel fuel, historic society, library, um, and storage building. City card. Um, totaling $1,948.36, uh, split up by miscellaneous programs. The ARPA grant expense, I do have a question about. That's a library expense. Library expense, but it's over $1,000, did we? It's more than one bill. Okay, more than one bill. Great big graphics, uh, arrow sign for $180.24. Jack F. Course uh, for propane, totaling $267.33. Jan Gearhart for canvas banner, $70. Uh, Jasmine LeBurn, uh, baseball volunteer <coughs> refund. Uh, Johnson Hardware and Rental, couple invoices, keys, locks, supplies, spray paint, glue, totaling $287.90. Uh, 
Uh, LaJoy Goldfine Attorneys, totaling $90 for a uh, record overpayment. Uh, Lamoille County Sheriff's Department uh, for a quarterly installment. Dispatch and law enforcement totaling $141,683.75. Uh, Leslie Dumas, baseball refund, $75 even. H.A. Minosh, Inc., uh, clogged line, $270. Uh, a NATO company, totaling $68,053.43. Uh, that's for gravel total. Um uh, Question, quick question about the NATO, uh, the Minaj, Claude line. Was that? That's a library. Okay. Napa Auto Parts for supplies, oil filters, and stuff, uh, $373.19. Open Approach uh, Desktop Engineer. Uh, we had to, our. The time changed, our phones did not change the time, so we had to call everybody. <laughs> okay. They charged $125 at Split Even Town and Village. Pike Industries, Cold Patch, $560.64. Premier Stone Supply, uh, Topsoil for Rec, $504. Rabbit Tracks for Equipment, $1,215. What's that for? What is that? I don't know what that's for. I know it's for it's the correct department that required that by the power rate for fuel and the trips. Is that part of what we have previously? That was what we approved for the repairs and cleanup of the old mill park. Gotcha. The uh, perimeter trail. There's a state of Vermont human rights training session uh, for $600. TD Bank. Um, Animal control expense, miscellaneous materials, softball, softball office supplies, trailhead building, uh, totaling $2,099.05. Uh, State of Vermont Treasurer for quarterly marriage licenses, $150. Payment to the Village of Johnson, um, you know, holiday sick vacation office admin, Social Security insurance. High insurance deduction, heat, water sewer, water sewer building maintenance, postage for $22,721.17. And that's the rest of the non reoccurring expenses. Do you have any questions about that, Beth? Can you hear me? Okay. I assume that due to uh, due to village is that accumulated this three months. Any other questions? Other voices? <laughs> um, one, as long as we're here, a quick one from last month. You had asked, uh, or the beginning of this month, our last meeting, you asked about. Uh, a piece of equipment that we, I wasn't sure what it was for. It was the cutting edge for the bucket on the loader. That was the John Deere Duramax. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is review and approval of minutes for meeting on past August 1st and 4th, 2022. April 1st. Yeah, yeah, April 1st. Get the April 1st one yeah. Sorry, I, I messed up on that. I went ahead and I, I did the fourth, the one from the fourth first. I didn't have the last, but there was another set before that. And I do have them finished now, but when I was finishing them up, I found I'm pretty sure we had a signing sheet that night that I thought I could come with me, and then I couldn't find it. And there was like one person whose name, last name I didn't know, and I asked just where it was, and I put it down on the signing sheet. And I couldn't find it out. And I, I didn't know those were gas and she tried to visit with other stuff. So I figured I'll just wait till tonight and ask you guys. Um, first, I'll ask if, um, did you have to see that signing? Do you think I got it here? 
I, I didn't see it. Of the, of the names of the people who spoke, which was most of the people there, but there was one guy who came in partway through the meeting and was asked to speak right after that. Mark, somebody? Mark French. Mark French, okay. So I'll uh, put that name in there and I'll send those out for tonight after this meeting. But anyway, you got the ones from April 4th. And you can those. I would move to approve the April 4th minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I would like to add that I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting, but. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Beth said aye. Uh, and I abstain. The ayes have it. Oh. All those opposed. Okay. The ayes have it. Rosemary, looks like the floor is yours. Sorry, did you pass out the report to the team? I've got them here if we want to okay. get into oh, more detail. But. How much detail you want to go into the record status report? Hey, Rosemary. Yeah. Can you bring a microphone, like point it toward you? I don't, I mean, not hearing you very well. Thank you. This uh, budget status sheet, does this reflect? The sixty-eight thousand. It does not. Okay. So we haven't pushed the page up yet. What would the, all the total of the bills we approved tonight, Eric? Correct. Yeah, for the uh, gravel. In that order. Thank you. We don't know yet what the impact would be. The total impact, no. To, to date, we're at 67% uh, spent of the budget. And the highway was at. Yeah, 53% is the total highway spent to date. I think oh. we should be okay with providing that there's no other surprises in the next few months. Yeah, right. Hear that? <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell the weather not to surprise us. We hope that we didn't have that highway person this year, and Brian got some money for some extra grants. So that helped us. A couple of our grants that have, we've been waiting on payment for were paid out this year, so we're we're in good shape. We. Uh, without all of the additions that we had, uh, we were running a surplus and we still will be adding this in. Also, some of the gravel and stone that we picked up uh, can go into construction expenses where it isn't currently allocated. Uh, that are currently our construction expenses are underspent and at least the portion of our stock right now will go to construction projects and not maintenance. So we're, we're in good shape. Uh, we, are, we are not running a deficit. We're still running a surplus. Less Last of a surplus than we were before, but still a surplus. Last year at this time, we were at 60.4%. Um, and we were at our current, uh, at the cap, uh, collected taxes were at 79.85% collected. Rosemary, where are we with tax collection? Um, this year we're at, currently we're at 81.22% collected. Okay, so our budget is higher and our collection is higher. Okay, Expen expend expenditures and uh, collected are both higher. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> And it looks like we've collected all the state and federal monies. Like the pilot. The pilot. The pilot. <coughs> state aid. Yeah, the state. Last <coughs> the state, the highway came in. Right. And at the end of April, the state will uh, do a true up on the taxes. So that should be 
our camera have been so loose if we get that to <laughs> I'd like to take a couple of minutes to go over the bill of taxes. Ones I've got um, in orange are ones I'd like to send to the tax attorney for the start tax sale. And once I've got question marks on, I'd like the board to make the proposed decisions because they're more unlanded ones. Like to spend the money to try to collect support. Seems like there's an awful lot of question marks. Guys, it's like a while ago that you would not want to do anything under a thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. But all the ones with question marks are over a thousand dollars. And it's multiple years as well. Yes. Right? Yeah, a lot of them are 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020, 2021. Do you want to go through those one at a time, those right? Yes. Um, if we do it that way, are we opening ourselves up to unfair treatment? Should should we just say any anything that's over a thousand dollars and anything that is over Two years goes to collections, okay. and then and then we don't. I'm just asking a question. I don't. I don't want to have us go, go through a list and pick people out individually. Right. Yeah. I mean, what if we decided no, we don't want to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that that gets into the question that Eric <laughs> talked about earlier. Right. <laughs> the first one on the second page is a. Mobile home that has been abandoned. And it's over five thousand dollars. Is that is On that the second the page? Park? Is that the same mobile home we talked about last year, Rosemary? No. So there's basically nobody to go after on that one. <laughs> They're not supposed to be moved without after all being paid. Is the park is this in that one's in um 10 hours back down the street? I mean, regardless of whether or not they abandon a building, they still owe taxes. It shouldn't determine whether or not we try to collect. May you know, it may not be as easy to try to collect, but <clears throat> Well, I mean, typically, if they've been abandoned, um, they won't even get bid on the tax sale because they're in such poor shape. Right. In which case, we would ultimately potentially um, grant a abatement. Yeah. That would be our next step. Right? I think I'd rather go that route and formally abate it if they, if I think we should make the attempt to get, get the taxes and if we can't, then we could put it on the list for abatement. So what was the action you needed tonight? Are all these uh, got marks plus the ones that check uh, question marks? Do you want to send, have you friends send them a final? collection of emails for the start tax proceedings. Okay. What, is it, what does it cost us to go after? I mean, what's the attorney cost charge per parcel? Do we know? They have a limit that they can charge the person, but whatever 
there will be the charge of down. The limit is 60% that the taxpayer has to pay. Then the thing will be left down. Of the attorney's fees, of collection fees. I just don't want to be spending attorney money that we're not never going to have a collect. Yeah, that's why I questioned that. Right. It still sets quite a precedence. We don't. And you've got one here that the person is is paying six hundred a month. Is that a is that a formal agreement with the yeah. Yeah. Is that So should that would that be excluded from going to if they're if they're faithfully making their payments and holding their tax agreement? We probably shouldn't send that one to tax services. Does everybody see what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. second to last. <clears throat> yeah. If, I mean, if they if they're honoring, if they've got a formal agreement to try and pay in there, and they are paying, I don't think we should send that one to tax would, that, would, would you agree with that, Rosemary? How's the rest of the board feel about that? Are you following that, Beth? Yeah, I would. I would not to be in support of going after anyone who has a payment plan with us. They have a payment plan for a reason. You won't, you won't, you won't get caught up at that rate, but yeah, I mean, if we can renegotiate that agreement. So I'm a little confused. Is it the bottom one or the second to the bottom? Second to the bottom. Second to the bottom. It's paying 600 bucks, and it's a mobile home. And maybe some of these people we should now the the state is doing OCM for property taxes too. I don't know. Everybody's eligible. So before actually formally sending it to tax sales, send them that sort of standard notice about do you need help paying your taxes? Yes. Yeah. Some of these are rental units and some are just mainly. Only permanent residents, primary residents yeah. qualify for that. Yeah. That yeah. first one, the rental unit. How would the board like to proceed? Are you all aware of motion or movement on the mobile homes? The rest of the field comfortable mm -hmm. homes. I don't know if the list is only mobile homes that you're talking about, but uh, I don't think we should specify a specific dwelling type. I think that goes back to the bias that Duncan was hinting at earlier. Well, it looks like all the ones that you've got question marks next to Rosemary are over a thousand bucks. <clears throat> I would move to go with this complete list, with the exception of the one that is currently uh, in an agreement to pay, um, and encourage Rosemary to send a letter to those people that she thinks are eligible or believes are eligible for the tax assistance through the state program prior to turning it over. Give them a deadline. You know, if we don't hear from you by, you know, and I'm perfectly comfortable leaving that up to Rosemary's discretion, I would do that. I don't know if that's a very good motion, but. Well, we have a motion on the floor, but we have a second. <laughs> I'll second it, I guess, is Don. If you know <laughs> what it was that I said. <laughs> motion and a second. Any further discussion? You can abbreviate it. <laughs> Re reiterate the motion. The motion is to have Rosemary send a letter to all of the properties listed with the exception of the property that has a payment plan. The ones that would be otherwise eligible for the tax assistance program? Well, maybe you need to clarify your motion for me. So we've got, we've got a, you, you don't have the list in front of you probably Beth, do you? I do not. Okay. So there's a list of a page of four um, 
four pages of delinquent taxpayers. Some of them are unlanded mobile homes. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my motion would be to sit, turn over the complete list for collection. But prior to doing that, Rosemary could send out a letter to the property owners that are eligible for taxpayer assistance with a drop dead right. date. And you need to clarify complete list. Do you want every name on here to be sent or do you want every- Anybody over a thousand bucks. Okay. So your motion is to send anybody that owes property taxes over a thousand dollars to our tax attorney. But before that, any primary residents that Rosemary feels could apply for the grant relief. She will give them a time period that she can make up and then send everybody over a thousand dollars to the tax collector minus anybody who has a payment plan in place right now. I couldn't have made the motion better myself. <laughs> you made it. I was just clarifying. <laughs> so that was one I seconded. <laughs> okay. So there's a motion Thank you. and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And the ayes have it. Okay. Anything else, Rosemary? Thank you very much for taking care of that. Next item on our agenda, we have representatives from the state college system here. Brian, do you want to do introductions? Because you know everybody. Well, I can't say that I know everybody yet, but uh, we have uh, the Chancellor, uh, Sophie Zadani. I, I practiced it this afternoon, and I just froze up for a second. Uh, CFO Sharon Scott and Director of External and Governmental Affairs, Catherine Lewis here. Do I have everybody? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I believe that we've got uh, Representative Noyes and uh, Westman, Senator Westman, to thank for helping set this up. Really appreciate everybody coming and uh, trying to make the presentation with us. You want me to sit somewhere or stand somewhere? Or what? If you could speak near the microphone sure. uh, when you're speaking, anything, especially behind the camera, right there on the table, is very muffled on yeah. on Zoom for Beth, our select board chair. I think it would be um, appropriate for all of us to identify ourselves as well. If that's yes. Yeah. Beth, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I am Beth. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My first hybrid sign. Okay, you can introduce yourself now. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm Beth Foy. I'm chair of the select board. I was also part of the um, I don't know why I can never remember the name, but I literally can never remember the name, but part of the NVU group that got together uh, after the announcement uh, in April of 2020 um, and have been pretty vocal on all things related to the Vermont State College system. Um, so thanks for your good and hard work. I know it hasn't been easy, um, but thanks for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Everybody. So I'm Brian Story, I'm the town administrator for Johnson. Mark Woodward, Johnson State College alum. <laughs> Eric Osgood. Evan Patch. Okay, thanks, Tim. She's the one that keeps everything together. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, well, we're really happy to be here, so thank you very much for the invitation. We actually had a really busy day because we had a board meeting this afternoon at which um, our board of trustees appointed the uh, incoming president for Vermont State University. Uh, Vermont State University will be the new university combining Northern Vermont University, Castleton University, and Vermont Technical College. So we're really excited about that. We had a pretty extensive search process. We had four candidates that came onto the campuses and met with everyone. Um, and we're just really delighted. Um, the, the president that's coming in is someone that's had experience in bringing together institutions. 
um, before. Um, so we think he's, uh, he's got a great vision um, for rural higher education. Uh, he really sees this as a great opportunity to create a model for the rest of the country. So he has great vision, great energy and enthusiasm, and we're just really delighted uh, that he'll be joining us in July. So the other, we have a busy week. We're going to uh, the New England Commission on Higher Education on Thursday. Um, NETI is the accreditor for all of our institutions. And we will be going, we've submitted what's called a substantive change proposal to them, which is putting forward what we're proposing to do. And we need their approval because they accredit us. And if we don't have accreditation, we can't access federal financial aid. Or, you know, we can't exist if we don't, we don't have uh, federal uh, approval for this. So that's going to be a big deal. That's on um, Thursday down in Massachusetts. And hopefully we'll get uh, a response back on Friday. We'll know sort of what direction we're headed in. But right now, what we're asking is to be able to launch the new university of July 1, 2023. So the new president's coming in this July. Um, so that gives them the opportunity to, to serve in a transitional role to help shape the new university moving forward. So we're, yeah, just a lot of things happening. It's very exciting. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm, I don't know if you have specific questions because I don't know if there were specific issues that you wanted us um, to talk about. I want to make sure we get whatever it is you're looking for from us um, moving forward. I'm sure Beth has some questions. <laughs> and the only one that I'm aware of that has a list, and I have a list. <laughs> Um, the first question is um, one that we're all very aware of. I think everyone in the state is aware of, which is the financial um, state of the college system and all you've worked to do to secure funds. So I'm, I'm curious what the current uh, state of financial affairs is for the system um, and how that's impacting the schools today. Yeah, so we had, um, as you probably know, the legislature created a select committee to look into the future of public higher education um, about two years ago after the announcement came out last April. And as part of that, it sort of laid out this path forward, which included bringing these three institutions together and then doing administrative consolidations. The other piece that was really recognized in that select committee report was the importance of the state supporting uh, the Vermont State College system. Um, at a higher rate than it has done historically, and also providing not only a, a higher base appropriation, but also providing bridge funding to help us get, give us the breathing space essentially to get our house in order, reduce our structural deficit. So that's underway right now. Uh, we've had tremendous support from the state over the past two years. Right now we're in the middle obviously of the, the legislative session. Um, we do have some good news on that, and I will let Catherine, our director of government and external relations. Sure. Um, thank you, Chancellor Sedani, and nice to meet you, Beth. Um, so in the select committee report, they recommended that the state raise our annual base appropriation to $48 million a year. It was current, it was at 30.5 million previous um, to the transformation started. And what happened last year is the state raised that by $5 million to 35.5. And um, as you know, the state is in the middle of the budget process. So the House has put forward their proposal. The Senate is about to put forward their proposal. The committee has voted it out, but it's about to move through the full Senate this week. And what it looks like is the House and the Senate are possibly agreeing on raising our base appropriation by an additional $10 million. Oh. So this would be a historic increase for the Vermont State Colleges. I don't think, we, since we were founded, I don't think we've seen an increase of $10 million. Mm -hmm. it's, a tremendous amount of support from the state. We are really, really excited about it. Um, and in addition to that, the, the Senate budget puts forward the bridge funding that we need for FY23 and, um, and also forward funds a little bit of the funding for FY24. So um, we're, I'll say it again, we're just tremendously excited about how things are looking in the legislature. Obviously, the budget has a ways to go. It's going to be the Senate process. They've got to work things out. The conference committee has to go to the governor for, for his signature, but that support is, is what we need for FY23. It's the funding that the select committee has recommended, and that puts us very, very close to the recommended base appropriation that the select committee identified as a number to put us on a path for financial stability moving forward. So the goal number long term is for the base appropriation 
to be $48 million um, if the budget moves through. Um, as it's currently written, the share will be at 45.5. So very, very close to that number, which is tremendously exciting. It's um, We owe a lot of thanks to our legislators um, and to everybody who supports us throughout this entire process um, should that move forward. So very exciting moment for us. This has all happened in the last couple of days. As we're hearing from Chancellor and that it's been a very, very <laughs> exciting, very busy week. Um, and it's and Monday. And it's Monday. <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of exciting things happening, and we're, we're really happy about the timing tonight to be able to come and meet with you. And very thankful that we have uh, senators and representatives here to uh, also thank for the support that they've shown us. You didn't have the pleasure of. Uh, you didn't have the pleasure of watching Richie twitch in his seat a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, 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 I would like you to talk a little bit about the transition money and the one time money that we have put in. And there is a, a, a one time component to this. Um, we put more in the transition. Yeah, the other, the other piece of this is that the select committee identified that we needed, the system needed to reduce its um, expenses or its structural deficit by 25 million. So it can be a combination of uh, cost savings, but also increased revenue. Um, and so Sharon as the CFO is kind of in charge of the money piece on that. Um, and we're, we're making progress. So we've identified the 5 million for this year. And we, you know, she's working really hard with the other uh, financial officers um, you know, across the system to make sure that we stay on, on that path moving forward. So, you know, we have responsibility too. Um, a lot of the savings that we're looking at um, are coming from administrative consolidations, um, administrative efficiencies, because right now we do things, you know, a little bit differently. We have, what is it, like 430,000 customizations of our IT system. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of, you know, work that needs to happen. There's a huge amount going on. Um, and we're really looking to build the strongest sort of foundation we can to make sure that as we move forward, we've got a really solid structure. Um, the legislature last year, uh, two years ago, uh, last year, gave us $20 million in transformation funding that's specifically to help us with the transformation because it does cost money to save money. Um, and we've really got to get um, things sorted out. So we've been able to use that transformation money to really take a very professional project management approach to the to the transformation. So we have uh, four core teams. We have uh, student experience, academic operations, administrative operations, and then workforce development. So we have four teams, multiple sub teams under each of those. We have people from across the system working on all the different teams to really figure out what are we doing. What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? What's the best way to do this? And now they're in the process of designing what it's going to look like as we move forward. So we're trying to do this from a very um, ground up approach, not a top down approach, but really involving the folks that know and do these jobs. You know, what's the best way to do it? How can we improve as we move forward? So again, just enormous amounts of work. But again, we couldn't really have done that if we hadn't had the additional transformation dollars to enable us to do that as we move forward. So I'd like to add in there though, specifically the additional bridge funding. So in addition to base appropriation, which is tremendous and obviously is vital for our ongoing success, it's also the bridge funding that is allowing us to make these changes in a really strategic way. So in the first year, it was $28.8 million. This year, it's $21 million. And right now, I believe in the Senate budget, it might be 14.9, is that correct? 14.9. 14.9. Um, that is an unprecedented amount of support for the Vermont State Colleges. We take that incredibly seriously. We believe very strongly that what we are doing is helping to maintain the fabric of the state of Vermont. And we're doing that in partnership with our colleagues in the legislature and the state government, because we do believe that what happens here at the Vermont State Colleges is really foundational for what happens here in our world. For those of you who know me, I spent 17 years just up the hill here at Johnson State um, and then at Northern Vermont University. I feel really strongly how important these colleges are and these locations are to these communities. And I think that's what we're absolutely seeing from your elected representatives. This amount of support, we could not do it without them. 
Thank you, Eric. You had a question? No, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, speak a little bit about the importance, I think, of this college and this community. Um, you know, it was started out as the Johnson Normal School, it evolved into the Johnson State College, and then the NVU, the Johnson campus, and now it's going to evolve again. But uh, in all of those uh, iterations, we had a president on campus. What's it going to be like now? With, you know, how much of a presence? Uh, I want to make sure Johnson doesn't get forgotten. Uh, when the college succeeds, we succeed in the town. So. Right. Yeah, so we will have one president. We'll be overseeing five different campuses. So we've got Johnson, Linden, Randall, Williston, and Castleton will all be covered. So the, the new president will not be living on any one campus because there were those kind of recognition that would be problematic. Um, we do anticipate that there will be a designated person on each campus that's kind of the day-to-day -day person. So when there's a, you know, a, a water pipe burst or whatever, you know, that you've got somebody right there that can, can help address those things. Um, we recognize that the, you know, the, the colleges and the communities are, are, are really coexist. And I will say the, the new president that's coming really recognizes that as well. Um, I hope when he gets here that we'll have an opportunity to make sure he comes around and meets like all the different communities and gets to know people. Um, as you might be aware, at the Linden um, campus of Northern Vermont University, um, out of the, the group that, that Beth was involved in, uh, one of the recommendations that came out of this was a learning and working communities concept. And um, Northern Vermont University received a significant gift um, from a donor, but specifically over at Linden, but to help pioneer this learning and working communities concept. And that's something, again, as we've looked at bringing these three institutions together is what's the best from these existing institutions that we can carry forward. And that's one of the concepts that's going to get carried forward with the new university. So we're really looking to build really strong relationships with the communities that we're in. We're looking to make sure that students, um, all students, <coughs> Have experiential hands-on learning. We're looking at paid internships so that while they're studying, they're also getting a paid internship in an area that's related to what they're studying. So when they graduate, they're career ready. Um, so we really are anticipating as we move forward having those partnerships with the communities. So really strengthening those relationships. The other thing we're looking at is again, we're going to have five um, sort of residential campuses. There are, you know, at Vermont Tech, for example, has 12 nursing sites and you know, so we have other um, locations, but talking about the five main ones, um, what we really want to see as we move forward is that each um, campus sort of has its own distinctive nature so that, you know, one will be programmed, but the other one will be, um, you know, students are interested in a particular um, culture or a particular thing that, that that might help influence which, you know, which campus they go to. So we really want to, as we move forward, really develop that sort of distinctive um, you know, campus approach to. Um, so we we have no intention of forgetting Johnson. Um, what what I'd like to see happen as we move forward is really thinking about what's what's a really great signature program that's a highlight that could be celebrated on each campus, and that that, that then could attract other students and get other folks to come up onto the campuses. Um, because even if the students aren't in that particular program, if it's a sort of exciting and interesting enough program. I think that will help attract students as well. Um, but again, you know, I think the legislature, the select committee, this recognition that these rural campuses are vital, I mean, to the communities they're in, but to Vermont as well. I mean, if you were looking to build a cheaper, um, you know, state higher education system, you'd put it all in one place. But that doesn't, that's not who we are. That's not how we serve the state. Um, our, uh, our mission is for the benefit of Vermont, and we take that really seriously. That we really need to serve the whole of Vermont, um, and you know we are largely, other than you know Williston, um, we are largely in the, the very rural parts of the state, and that's sort of built into the DNA for this new university as well moving forward. Thank you. Any other? Did you get all your questions in, Beth? No, but Mark can go. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in your marketing approach 
for increasing enrollment because you know some of it's COVID, but certainly it feels like in the community here there's a lot less students. And I don't know the exact number at, at the college right at the moment. But I'd be curious to hear what you're thinking is on how we're going to um, increase our enrollment because that really the students in our town really influence the life of this community. I have a couple other questions. Yeah, I mean, we recognize that um, the demographics are kind of against us. So we know that we're yes. not going to grow our way out of this moving forward. Uh, we know that there's fewer and fewer sort of traditional age students um, and fierce competition for them. Um, so one of the things that we would, we're looking at with the new university is really, and, and not just in the university the system as a whole, so including the community college of Vermont, is really making sure that we're addressing all the needs. Um, so not just a traditional age student, but lifelong learners. So we know in the state, there are a lot of people that have some college credits, but no degree. Uh, we know that there are people looking to upskill and reskill as the, as the economy changes. So people may need to, you know, get another qualification or a certificate or a credential. So really trying to embed that within what we're doing moving forward. So we're not planning on growing our way out of it. We are hoping to keep our enrollment stable, but we're really looking at um, also targeting um, populations that we haven't historically reached. So again, in the state, we have a lot of students that graduate from high school and that don't go on to college. So that's a potential market that we can do a better job on reaching out to them, the value proposition of going to college and the benefit of doing that. Uh, we've um, working with the community college, we have a lot of um, nested programs so that students can start, you know, get a certificate, get a qualification, then maybe step out, come back, finish an associate, step out, come back, finish up, you know, getting a bachelor's. So really trying to think holistically about the students that we serve and how can we best serve them move forward. Um, but yeah, the traditional, you know, 18 to 24 year old market, I, you know, it's, you know, we're going to do what we can in terms of having attractive programs that attract students from out of state, and particularly some of these signature programs could be regional, regionally attractive and attract more students. But, um, you know, we have to be realistic too about our ability to increase enrollment through the traditional um, graph, you know, student demographic. Is that, that just... Yeah, so we get more people here to have more kids, <laughs> have them grow up really quickly and then come. But <laughs> well, go ahead. Some some oh. get, some of my concern also is retention of students. You know, they come and they don't continue on. I, I don't know what the your retention numbers are, but that's that's a that's an ongoing issue of students that come and they, it doesn't work for them or they don't. Data. How do you know what the retention numbers Yeah, the, are reten the retention numbers need improvement without doubt. And the thing with retention is that you've already recruited the student, they've already come. So it's really, really important that we then retain that student. That's much, e you know, much easier once they're here. Um, right. So if we can increase retention, we are effectively increasing enrollment. <clears throat> uh, so one of the, the transformation teams that I was talking about, but there's an advising team. And we're really looking at coming up with a very, very strong advising model moving forward with a lot of student supports uh, built into that. So really investing in student support moving forward uh, with the goal of moving the needle on retention. But you're right, retention is an issue and we definitely have room to improve that. And I believe you've been to the center for um, I, I'll actually just add on to that. Um, one thing that I've been looking at a lot lately is um, some of our student demographics. And about a third of our students across the system can be identified as, as non-traditional students. So they don't fit into that 18 to 24 year old um, traditional bucket that you think of as, as a college student. They might be a student that supports um, a dependent on either end of the age spectrum. They might be a student that works full or part time. They might be a student school part time. And um, when I think about all of the things that are going on in our students' lives, um, one of the things that I also think about is the additional supports that they need to be successful and to persist semester to semester and finish out their degree program. And one thing that um, I've been particularly excited about working on um, is this is specific to our nursing program, but it's a it's a project that I have been working on lately that has had some increased advising and tutoring support to give our students the support and the resources that they need to be successful. 
And again, that's specific to that one program, but it's something as Chancellor Zanet noted that we're looking at um, kind of across the spectrum as we look at um, where we're moving and using transformation as an opportunity to take a look at those things. I think one thing that you may be seeing here locally, honestly, is some of the after effect announcements that occurred in the spring of 2020. Sharon, can you speak up a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, one of the things that you are likely seeing is the after effect of the enclosure announcements that were made in the spring of 2020. Because of that, um, there was already concern in the marketplace because of merger, and it was a delicate time for Northern Vermont University and these locations. That announcement shook local confidence mm -hmm. in the organization. Um, the work that the legislature has done has helped to undergird and support that, but it's a very difficult message. As we all know, positive news does not go as fast as negative news. And so all of the acu and cry from the spring of 2020 is still felt in reverberations. It's like a ripple on a pond. You can still feel it and hear it in our communities. I live just down the road in Morrisville. You still hear it. We hear from the Obama Union, people who are saying, are you still open? Uh -huh. So those are pieces of information that we have to continuously push back on. And that is work that honestly is very difficult to do last year COVID. It is work that the, the institution locally here at my university, President Mills and his team have really been working on this past year to really push that forward. And then our ability to be able to really focus on this from Vermont State University and the excitement that's been felt through the creation of Vermont State University and the incredible backing and the beginning of support from the legislature can and will help us move forward. But it is difficult and it's been a struggle here. It's been a struggle at each of the institutions, locations that we were involved in that closure announcement, but it is felt most keenly at the two locations from the so we can rebound and recover. It's going to take time because all of that is a reverberation. So any person who can be an ambassador and come back and say, these institutions, these locations are alive and well, and they are great places to live and learn, that's all something that's really valuable. Every one of us needs to be ambassadors for that. And I think one of the things the incoming uh, new president has talked about when he was here uh, on his campus visits was also about really building much stronger relationships with the high schools and actually the middle schools as well <coughs> to really just start you know building those pipelines and making sure that, that students know that we're here and what kind of programs we have and what the options are. So I think again having having additional capacity which this funding has enabled us to do just gives us more more ability to do things. I mean, we've been in a sort of starvation mode, I would say, for almost 20 years. And you just, you know, I think it became apparent we just couldn't cut our way out of the situation we were able to maintain our existing um, institutions. It just wasn't possible to do that. But with investment and then again being able to pool resources, I think we're going to be able to do a much better job of getting the messages out and really building those connections to the high schools, the guidance counselors, um, and then into the middle schools even. So you're right, COVID has a challenge, right? Because one of the ways you get people on campus is you do campus <coughs> in the summer, right. and when you don't have any of those, right, it's, yeah. Well, I'm excited about having having signature programs at the university. I mean, there's a dramatic need for teachers right now. Right. Johnson used to be a teaching college. I don't, I, if you ask me right now, what is Johnson great at? I'm not sure I would know. The education program is a strong one. Right. <laughs> and it's a very, it's the, the strength of the education program at Johnson is being carried through to the other, the other institutions right. also have um, education, but the strength of the Johnson program is the one that's actually, um, that model is being carried forward across the others. So again, right. really trying to build on where the strengths are from individual institutions and then have everyone benefit from that moving forward. That's good to hear. I think one thing that you said um, is really important, and that is um, trying to do the outreach, outreach to the high schools um, and the tech centers um, and community college and, and trying to build on a program where you can train Vermonters to do jobs that Vermont needs done. Um, you know, so if you can figure out a way to do that, um, more power to you. 
Um, you know, the only other thought that I really have is um, I think all of us recognize the value uh, that the college brings to our community uh, and our county. You know, not not just Johnson, but you know, having having a college in this county is it's important um, and it, it brings a lot of value and. It's not often something that you can, you know, get your hands around. Um, but you know, the intrinsic value of, of a higher an institute of higher education is is super, super important. And you know, if there's anything that we can do um, at our level, um, I, I think I'd probably speak for the board in saying we we want to be, you know, we want to enable anything that we, you know, anything that we can do to help you be successful in our community. Great. I mean, I think just having, you know, again, ambassadors, people, you know, speaking with enthusiasm about what's going on, I think is really valuable um, as we move forward. Um, but yeah, it's that was the recognition. I think the, you know, our, our institutions are economic engines in the communities where they're located, their employers, um, and if they go away, you're really abandoning those, those communities. So I do think that was one of the things that had come out with the legislative support and the select committee was recognizing it actually can cost the state a lot more to close these institutions rather than support them and let them, you know, blossom and flourish and really serve the state well. I do worry when I hear, and I've, you know, been pretty vocal about this all along. I do worry when I hear that we're not focusing the majority of energy on the traditional student. Uh, that worries me when you say a third of the students are non-traditional. Well, that means that two thirds still are. And my children are um, ages 17 to almost 20 right now. So my friends, uh, pretty much everyone around me has kids that are either off to college um, or will be very soon. And um, the state college systems, frankly, don't usually come up in conversation. Castleton does on occasion. Um, and, and also a lot of the kids are going to New Hampshire and they're going to like Colby Sawyer or other small campuses in New Hampshire or Maine or Northern New York. Um, and I, I really feel that's a shame. Like, I'm not sad for them going to those campuses. I think it's great. I fully support them, but I would hope that our campus would be talked about as eagerly as those other campuses, because they're not that different. Um, so for what it's worth, I, I really hope that I understand the demographics are shifting, um, but we still have a lot of people leaving locally to go not too far away because they can pay less um, and get that same small town feel. Um, yeah, the affordability is a, is a key piece. We've actually, even despite the financial challenges we've had, we've actually held tuition uh, frozen for the past couple of years and also for this coming academic year, because we do recognize that one of the big issues for us is affordability. We, I mean, we're funded, our revenues essentially are the state appropriation, state funding, and then tuition. And, and because of that, because historically we haven't received much state support as a consequence, it's driven our tuition up. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've been unaffordable, but it's definitely a high priority of our board. Um, to really try to figure out ways, again, even doing the, the learning and working communities, if we can provide paid learning experiences to students, it's a way to help bring the cost down. Um, mm -hmm. But really trying to be thoughtful about that as we move forward, because affordability is definitely a barrier. And we've seen from some of the other programs that the legislature supported over the past couple of years, that if you take cost out of the picture, Vermonters do want these courses and these programs and they, they come and, and take them. Um, so we've had tremendous support from some of the initiatives uh, the legislature provided, including um, we had um, with COVID dollars, the state provided some free courses to anyone that had been impacted by COVID. And I even remember the numbers better than I am. But we had well over a thousand people take advantage of, of that. Um, and it came with some wraparound services as well, um, you know, to help support. Because again, it's not always just the tuition, it's the uh, um, the other costs as well, books, transport, all that, that other stuff. Um, but affordability is key. So having good, strong academic programs and becoming more affordable, um, you know, that's the path that we want to be on as we move forward. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I have one question that I'm just going to wrap a whole bunch into. 
um, which is we talk a lot about economic development and we talk a lot about economic uh, sustainability. Um, and my tying of a bunch of questions together is um, what is the long-term vision for the John Johnson campus? How is that impacting staff and faculty right now? And how does that tie into economic development locally? <laughs> so I probably separate it out. You have 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just one line, please. <laughs> so in terms of, uh, you know, faculty and staff and current employees, uh, we, we know there's been, you know, turnover, obviously, with the uncertainty that's been around the colleges. Um, so at this point, as we move forward, we're going to be looking, you know, and when people leave, um, you know, on the one hand, it's helpful because it helps us deal with cost. On the other hand, it's not because it's not strategic, right? So the wrong people may, may not people, but the wrong positions, you know, you become, so for example, IT is a huge struggle right now. It's, it, our IT people are getting poached left, right, and center because we really can't pay them, um, you know, the kinds of salaries that other people can pay them. Um, so as we move forward, we, we really are looking at, um, you know, the resources we have internally. And even if someone's position is a duplicate position, for example, there may be other positions that they could uh, train for or, or be able or interested in filling. So we're not envisioning um, a significant reduction in force uh, of any kind. Um, as far as the workforce development piece goes, um, one of the things we're going to be doing is creating a workforce development division. So any credit bearing um, continuing education or workforce development needs to be provided by one of the accredited institutions. So either Vermont State University or the Community College of Vermont. But one of the things we've realized is that the, the system does a lot of workforce development, but it's kind of hidden away because it's not part of our main, mm -hmm. you know, our main focus. So we're, we're going to be creating a workforce development position for an executive director to really pull together those efforts to make sure that people know how to access them. So not your regular students, but other um, other folks that are interested in getting, again, upskilling, reskilling, getting a credential, they know where to come, how to access it. And also for employers, I mean, if we have local employers here who want to um, provide training for their workforce or whatever, that they've got, they've got a very obvious clear path to reach <coughs> out to provide that. So we do a lot of that work primarily through the community college and also through Vermont Technical College, but also at, at Northern Vermont University, there is um, that kind of workforce development that goes on particularly um, through the Linden um, office there. So uh, really looking to, again, play a partnership role with communities, with employers, with the legislature to make sure, um, again, that we are training um, students so they're ready, career ready when they graduate and they're gonna be ready for the jobs that Vermont needs them. Um, to fill as we move forward. So I, I think, does that answer your, your Well, question? how does, uh, uh, yeah, that answers most of it. How does that, both the workforce development, but also the liberal, the liberal arts side of it too, that's an important component, right? But how do those tie back to what the vision for the Johnson campus will be? Yeah, so liberal arts is really important. I know we often get that question from faculty of, well, why, you know, this focus on careers and technical education, um, you know, it's really important to understand that liberal arts is also important for careers, right? It's the soft skills, the critical thinking, things that employers are looking for. So for me, it's not an, an either or, it's an and. I mean, we're going to be doing this and that. I think Johnson historically has been much more a liberal arts focus, and I don't envision that changing significantly. I think that would still continue um, to, to really, again, really strengthen um, the liberal arts component within the system. Um, certainly, you know, the education programs, but the arts, uh, performing arts, um, you know, mental health counseling. I mean, there's a lot of really important programming that happens at Johnson and certainly see that continuing as we move forward. Okay. Is there any I more questions? Sorry, the last question I have, Evan. Uh, I was just going to ask if there's any uh, more questions from the board. This is going back to what Duncan said. So I hear you on being an advocate, and that's an important piece to all of this. I totally understand and agree that that's important. But is there something that we as a town, as a town government, as a 
communication vessel uh, can do or should be doing to represent the needs of Johnson as it pertains to the state college system or um, in support of the college system that would help in a significant way. I think that there are some things that the, the town itself can do. Um, we will be launching a new brand for Vermont State University in the not so distant future. Um, it would be a good opportunity to engage with the town and the businesses to help build some excitement. You've got a lot of Main Street here mm -hmm. with a lot of businesses and a lot of opportunity to be able to engage the future of Vermont State University with Johnson and embed that within Johnson. Um, any opportunity, I know there's issues with Route 15 being owned by the town and all that, but your businesses are not owned by the state. And, um, and so that gives you some opportunity to be able to engage and partner with there. I believe that we will also be having some events as well. Is that correct, Catherine? Yes, um, there is anticipated to be some brand launch parties on each of the campuses. So I don't have dates to give you yet, but I, am, I will make sure that all of you are invited. Um, and so there'll be some opportunities around the brand launch to, um, to engage and to celebrate and uh, to bring that energy um, into the, the town of Johnson um, as well. And I know that the, the marketing team is really looking forward to that as the students are really looking forward to it as well. I think one of the things that I'm excited about as a refugee from Johnson is that the Badger gets to remain. So the Badger will still be the Badger. It's going to be the Badger for this location. Um, but we have an opportunity to be able to engage the Badger with Vermont State University and with Johnson. Because there's a close connection with that badger, despite it making my children when they were very small cry. Um, but he <laughs> changed it. It's a friend of Jack. It's a friendlier badger now. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> the, um, but it's an opportunity to engage and extend the old, as you were saying before, we were the normal school or Johnson State College, Northern Vermont University, to be able to extend the history into where we're going as we move forward and how we communicate that and how we as a town and a university work together to extend that conversation and bring the community along becomes incredibly important in terms of the form of vehicle and communication and really having that close connection between <clears throat> what happens up on the hill and what happens down in the town. So just to throw a Another way that we could engage on your party, for example, um, the town is responsible for Legion Field where Tuesday Night, Live, Tuesday Night Live is and those in this area knows what that means. It means it's a big concert and lots of people show up every Tuesday night during the summer. Um, but we can give permission for use of that field, for example, if you wanted your, your party <laughs> to sprawl. Um, maybe you don't, maybe you do, I don't know. Um, but things like that are options and when I think of growing up in Johnson, when I grew up in the 80s and 90s in Johnson and the college was thriving and college kids were everywhere. And if we could get, get to a point where we have some of that, uh, I know you're looking for it too and trying to build it, but if we could get some of that energy on campus and then getting that energy back into town, um, that would be really great. And we should think of ways to partner to do that. That'd be great. Another small thing that we might be able to do, I, up until very recently, I've been on the Johnson Historical Society board. Um, and one of the things we do pretty much every Monday is accession items into our collection. And some of the items that we've accessioned in our collection are yearbooks dating back to the normal school, um, you know, right, right through to the you know, 1960s, 70s. Um, so it's kind of neat just to see those, you know, those JSC uh, yearbooks in normal school. And we would also, um, we as a historical society um, have a number of projects that we would like to engage uh, with the college on um, that, you know, might be a, a great work study um, component that would, you know, enlighten them on some of the aspects of the greater Johnson area and Johnson history. And um, we could make use of some of the talent of, of some of your students up there. So. I would absolutely think that we have some students that might be interested in such a thing. I also want to just invite you to consider 
that the college does have archives up in the library of um, materials and memorabilia and other things from its earliest days to right through to today. So um, there might be a way to partner with some of that in terms of the um, historical society and some of the things that are in the archives here at the college itself. So there might be an opportunity to do some partnering there. I think um, I think you would find it probably quite amenable to it because sometimes it's very hard to maintain that collection um, and it doesn't get any visibility the way it is now. The other piece I was just thinking of was uh, the Babcock Preserve um, that belongs to Johnson. Do you, you guys know about that? Is oh, yeah. In, in Eden. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say there's going to be a, a, a celebration of the Babcock Preserve, I think, coming up at the end of April. Um, but that's something that uh, sort of again looking at sort of a, a, an unused asset that belongs to the college that really hasn't uh, had the you know had a lot of investment or attention paid to it. So really trying to highlight that as we move forward as well, possibly as a field station, a biological field station. So. A wonderful place. Yeah, that's what I heard. I wish I could go. I'm not going to be able to go, but I heard it's. Um, yeah. I'm going to take this opportunity. Uh, being that we have 15 minutes left on our agenda, we have a pretty packed one. I'd like to get some public comment and questions. If there is some, the board has asked questions for 45 minutes. So um, I do see Scott Meyer, you have a question. Could you speak up a little bit just so yeah, that's in here? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to eat mask. I'm six feet away. So just before you, it's all good. So um, you know, I was a SUNY graduate from New York State. I'm also a Johnson State graduate. Unconventional student and non traditional. So, the, the thing that I had noticed between the two, the soon, the soon schools work really tight with the state in their environmental science program. When it came to Johnson, there's a bit of a disconnect. So, SUNY school used a lot of state forms, a lot of state research, but basically, when you graduated, the state could pick you up. So instead of writing a check to the state for your education, you were getting a check, which was awesome. Johnson seemed, and again, this is 30 years ago, plus years ago, had a bit of a disconnect. So we did a lot of the same type of work, but it wasn't really affiliated with the state. And I brought that up a few times to my professors. The cool thing about Johnson, all the professors I had, Road really, really hard. So when he graduated, Johnson had a really good rep. I think almost everybody in my graduating class had two or three offers to work, including myself, which was awesome because I could start back my bones. So um, the, wet, the latest example that I saw was Paulson's College. They just got certified for their water testing lab. So they're working with our agents. And they have a certified lab. So there's a student there I'm working in a state certified lab. That's huge on the resume. Mm -hmm. So if they graduate and they want to move on, go to the private sector, the public sector, that's on the resume that they actually work and help move along the state certified lab. Some of the research I did on the Johnson, I did all of the students on the last Sorry, professors, for your final grade, you have to have a publisher quality paper upon graduation of that class. It's certainly possible to do because the fact that it's certified. You know, the tech center now is ran off for the industry. I just had students moving into the industry, the more we ran into the work, you know, the monitoring of the professional work on the environmental science side, not so much the liberal arts, because it's not something I can understand. Wouldn't it be a good idea to start working with the state of Vermont, especially with the Fish and Wildlife Program, as we're always looking for help? Even more of a, a tie state. Again, when I graduated, everybody had work. Maybe it was just a great time back in 86, 87. Maybe jobs were really available there. But it's just something I wanted to throw out. I'm not 
sure that's happening or if you're in for lack of a better word, for lack of a public display of the needs to know whether or not you want to share your role for work. Yeah, I think when we move forward, we really do want to go in on those relationships. And we're always looking to take those channels and we're trying to build these partnerships with the state um, to figure out if there are ways um, to strengthen that. So um, I do know um, there's a consortium that EVM and now the Vermont State College system, because um, we did it that way on, on um, some environmental stuff. And I'm just not sure what the detail. No, this is a different one. It's a new one that's just, just got signed. Uh, but I think it also relates to water, which is kind of the same But it's all around sort of like climate related and environmental stuff. So, um, yeah, trying to build those partnerships. I do think historically, for, for better or worse, I mean, we, um, we know in the SUNY system, you know, how politics is really penetrated into the school system, not always in a positive way. Um, so it's kind of has mixed blessings, right? Um, but I do think as we move forward, particularly with the increased support we have from the legislature and the state, um, I want to see us position ourselves as being that partner that the state's going to look to um, to work with moving forward. So again, if there are opportunities uh, for our students to be getting experiential learning, whether it's with the state or the private business, I think that could be really valuable. So um, yeah, I mean, we're open to trying to figure those, those uh, connections out. I mean, Vermont Tech, does a phenomenal job. Uh, they have their return on investment for students, they're number seven in the entire country. I mean, they people are lining up to take their graduates. So it's really important that we can take some of what they do and do well and then bring that to the other uh, the other campuses, the other institutions. Any idea why things sort of fell off? But like 30 years is a long time to so put through all the pages to try to figure it out. So when I first started our new age group sort of infiltrated state government it was mostly Johnson State grads, either in chemistry positions or environmental science positions within the state. And then I stayed in the state of Vermont for a little over 30 years. And what I had noticed um, was less and less Indian Johnson students and more and more and more university students coming into the program. Johnson sort of dwindled. I have no idea why, because I know there's quality students that come out of that institution. I don't think it's black. Yeah, it's not the way I am, it's not the other way. Going the other direction. Thank you, Scott. Does anybody else in the audience have a question? Kyle? Yes, thank you. Um, so, I, yeah, a lot of questions that I had were answered. Um, but one thing I'm, I'm not clear on is when you say this is a hybrid, a new hybrid model, what does that mean exactly? Is that part Zoom, part in person, or you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so one of the things that came out with the Select Committee report was that, um, and partly because of enrollments being what they are. Um, but we teach a lot of very, very small classes um, in a way that's just not economical. Um, so we already had a number of faculty doing this prior to the transition. So for example, we have a, so the math faculty at Johnson um, team up with um, math faculty down at Castleton. And so they may teach their regular classes here at Johnson, but they will also have a couple of, or several Castleton students participating in the class with them synchronously, you know, to a telepresence thing. So um, we're really looking to build on some of that. Also with COVID, we had a number of, um, again, for example, non-traditional students who then were able to access programs because things were available um, remotely, um, but then they couldn't continue once they had to go back to work in person. So we're piloting something that's called face-to-face -face plus. So it really is trying to um, basically make our courses and programs as accessible as possible so that students can be in person or they can participate remotely synchronously or even asynchronously. So if you can't come, you have a work conflict or you, you just, you, you know, you're, you're an adult student working parent or whatever, you would take courses in the evening, you can do it asynchronously. So. Um, to really try to make it as available as possible to as many students as possible. 
So we're, we're getting ready to launch second quarter face-to-face -face, uh, plus pilot. This summer we've had, we had about 48 faculty volunteers to be part of this pilot. Uh, we're actually um, funding 28 faculty members to do it and then the others will, will, will get additional support. But really it's a kind of a train the trainer model. So they're going to work this summer really closely on course design, course instruction, um, and then be piloting some more of these programs in the fall and gradually transitioning to that. So we recognize there's going to be some programs, but it's going to be really, really hard <laughs> to do that. Way. So, um, you know, so it won't work for everything, but for a lot of programs, it really does open up accessibility um, for students. So it's another way for us to be able to reach more people. Um, you know, and expand the number of, of students that we have in classes. So it's a, yeah, it's a new concept. And again, the technology is just improving by leaps and bounds. So initially, when we had to pivot um, to be remote, you know, frankly, I'm sure some faculty did a really good job with it, but it's not, that wasn't ideal. We just take the class notes and then you read them out or whatever. This is really that next generation of really building on that because there is a way to do online. Um, really well and so really making sure that it's high quality what we do moving forward with that. Okay, thank you. That explains that better. And my follow-up question is I guess uh more um some of those classes where that model is really one for well which is more in the arts right sector right. and um and so just um yeah I, the arts are something that's near to injured my heart, and, and that's how I'm part of this community. Um, and my husband is an adjunct professor in the arts at Wisconsin. And so, um, and in thinking about how the identity of MVU Johnson campus and what its strengths are, and um, and I, I was listening to the Vermont edition segment that that um, you were in. Chancellor and uh, a couple other faculty, and they're talking about how they're going to keep the identity of their different um, campuses alive. And the, um, the thing for Johnson that the faculty member said is, we're known for the arts and our arts program. So, um, and in thinking about branding the Johnson campus and also then tying it into the branding of the town and their efforts in, in, um, in that. Just, you know, just um, I'm not sure what my question is, but just being, you know, just thinking about how that's going to, to play out with this new model and also keeping the identity of your campus um, really clear and, and celebrating that and marketing it and, and how it ties into the greater community in the town. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly sort of right. So, I mean, again, you might have somebody that's uh, Say a business major, uh, where they could go anywhere because there's business on all the different campuses. But if they business major, but they really are interested in the arts, so they want to have that you know, sort of co-curricular activity, then that would be a reason to put the Johnson campus in actually, right? So um, trying to think about ways to make sure that the campuses retain that kind of distinctiveness, mm -hmm. um, because there are cultural differences between the campuses, and then how do we maintain that while also being able to provide access to the programs, um, you know, statewide? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the audience? We're running just about perfectly on time. <laughs> if there's no other questions from the board, I'd like to thank everybody for coming in very much um, and allow them to enjoy their night while we're here until midnight. Who's buying coffee? Good. You guys are welcome to stay. <laughs> we have some riveting conversations. Real, real Rich, can you guys stay just for the next topic? You too. Thank you very yeah. much for coming in. I really appreciate it's, it. It's ten. It's ten minutes. Not even. Thank. Thank you very much again for coming. All right. Next item on the agenda is the Public Works Supervisor Highway Foreman Report. And I believe uh, we got a nice printout here. Beth, you got my text of I the did. printout? Okay. So, Jason, would you like to have the floor? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm doing fantastic. Hi, Jason. Eric's on the edge of his seat. Yeah, yeah. I see that. Just riveting. <laughs> so, I put it in, uh, in the back of the floor there. This uh, the road, the capital roads, we call it Hawkins Road. 
and what we call a four load on the federal road. So highway, you can continue. Are uh, the ones that were utilized tonight by a staff car for this is probably leaked through from something that i had requested um by the way thanks for getting the grader out the roads are in great shape i would say johnson's roads are the best in the county uh, i don't know anybody that could argue that um and we really appreciate what you guys put in for overtime and everything getting the roads so they were passable for mud season the reason i asked you dan and rich to stay and I know this is way too late in the year to even bring it up as a topic, but this small town alone paid about $68,000 in material because of mud season. And this list proves the exact culprits um, of where it costs the town money. Every one of these roads that was expensive, um, I mean, tree farm road right here, we had, 11 loads of three quarter inch fracture and 13 loads of plant mix. So 24 loads total. And you could guess to me $300 a load ish every time a truck goes up Jason. So that, that road alone cost us what's 24 times three, $7,500. We have one tax paying. Six loads of steam. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we can keep going to like, what, what's that 84? That road alone cost us $8,400 as the taxpayers. We have one tax paying resident on that road. We have to keep it passable. The fire department has to get there if there's an emergency. NEMS has to get there if there's an emergency, which would be um, you know emergency medical services. So the taxpayers are paying 100% for sap haulers that are falling underneath agricultural practices when the technology changes that are there they don't need to be putting the punishment on these roads, but we can do nothing about it other than pay for it. Like I said, I know it's too late, but it might be something to at least discuss next year because we're not the only town. I can guarantee you I could drive to any town. We're lucky that we had a good enough crew, we have close enough material that we fared better. And our mud abatement program, I think, helps a lot. That's all I had for you guys. Just an earful. You can talk about Kevin, it. I really thought you were going to talk about um, state having uh, supplemental grant money for towns in health. I don't think that the state like should this be year. <laughs> I don't think the state should be responsible for paying for towns. I think the state should give the towns a ship that they could control these things and manage themselves. I don't want to come to the state every two weeks for money. The state was looking into uh, a declaration of state of emergency, right? For, for uh, fee money. For money. The state for money. wasn't looking into solving the problem. They were looking into throwing money at it. Well, yeah, that would come from FEMA, but it would at least reimburse all of the communities that only you know, $68,000, that's a lot of money. For and we're on the low end spectrum, I believe. Other towns, I think, had more money. I don't know exactly. And the other thing I'd like to point out is we didn't have to close one road. Yeah, that was have what, Jason? We didn't have to close one road. Uh -oh. Pretty sure all the other towns with road crews had to close one here or there. I may be an outlier on this, but um, it seems to me that over the course of my 30 years involvement in local government, that there's been an increasing interest on the part of VTrans to open up anything and everything to FEMA reimbursement. Um, and I, you know, I, I just I, I'm not I'm not keen on the idea. Um, I would like. I would like it if, you know, the town could post weight limits that we could hold people to. And that way, everybody in this room isn't paying for profit going in somebody else's pocket. I have no problem with people running a business or wanting profit, but it's all coming at the nickels of everybody in here. And I'm sure the same thing's happening for you guys in your towns. You live in the county.
Basically, um, basically what you're saying is the overweight sap trucks is the wrong time of year. I'm saying overweight vehicles, but they are the number one culprit at that time of year. And they're exempt because they have ag exemption. I think the majority of them try to fall under it, but a lot of them actually have registered vehicles. And when you have a registered vehicle that's not registered as agriculture, they no longer fall under that. It's my understanding. Regardless, we spent the money and I'm glad that we were able to keep the roads open. But also like, thank you. I can talk more about that too, um, you know, in the next legislative session, but um, it would be something interesting to talk to um, on the transportation committee about or, or whatever. I don't, I don't have an answer to it, but I definitely have seen what you're saying. I know there's not an answer to it tonight. I just. I think one of the places to start is on the LBC. They come with a broader wind because there's a lot of very rural towns that um, um, all have the same issues. And if there was some direction that you pushed in, certainly the best time to get a hold of us to talk about that is. Um, I was going to bring it up next time you guys are here. I figured you're already here and you can get a year. But I would encourage you to talk to the lead and Mike and see if there's other towns that have the same issue and anybody has any thinking about what what might be the things that you do. I understand. We need to get back to the agenda item. I was just giving an earful. I appreciate your time. Is there anything else? Does board members have questions about the report? Before they take off, could I just put a plug in? I believe Make it's quick. H159 that opens up uh, TIF funding for smaller communities. Mm -hmm. I believe the Senate may vote it up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys can find your way to support that, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Yes. Do you have any questions about the report? Duncan, Mark, Matt, Eric. The only thing I would just note, like you mentioned, that uh, some of our shortest length highways, Mudgett Road, Tree Farm Road, are some of the biggest hitters for uh, loads of gravel and cost for us. I assume that's because we haven't done mud abatement on those roads? No, that's because uh, their sap trucks are hauling sap from out of town up to one trigger house that's on the Jason, I'm really not hearing you well. And <clears throat> it's overweight overweight vehicles driving in from out of town going up Mudget Hill. Is that good? For Mudget Hill specifically? Yeah. I'm the speaker. <laughs> uh, this is a good report. It definitely shows roads that we put, you know, you guys put loads on. I do believe that the mud abatement program that's been in place has saved the town money this year based on what I hear from other towns that they're spending. We're considerably below it. So we're a third of We have Slightly less roads, but yeah, they have, they have a lot of asphalt. Five plus miles of dirt and then they have a real I'll bet you Hyde Park was up there too. You said didn't have much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the newspaper. <laughs> One thing I have a question, you guys. Is there an ETA of the fifth guy? Of what? The fifth guy. I know we talked about maybe when the new board we would start talking about maybe a, the fifth guy because we budgeted for it. And I'm all girl, I assume you mean. 
What'd you say? I said, or girl. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> person, person. Uh, probably we should take that up as a discussion in our next board meeting. I don't know where that is personally, yeah. um, but it's a good question. I know a lot of guys have vacations coming up, you know, they're not hooking in a water. So. Yeah. Jason, you also had an item on here, salt budget for upcoming winter season as a discussion item for the board. Yeah, I just want to let you guys know we spent uh, about 50% of the budget sit on salt. That's awesome. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you guys if you wanted me to get the rest of it in because of the prices of fuel and stuff, and it's probably going to go up or not. Well, it's the Lord's pleasure on that item. Sounds like we, are you, you're talking about in the current budget here. Yeah, we, it's already been budgeted for, but I only we only use half of what we budgeted for. I ended up three hundred ton. We still got two hundred and twenty-eight ton, give or take, that we could get brought in. Yes, we can finish out the contract we have at our current prices. We don't need it for this year, but we can just stock up. You got, we'll lose. You got room for it in the shed. We'll lose a little bit over the summer from rain and other things, but we won't lose that much. And it is very likely to save us quite a bit of money. The stuff that hardens up, I we set aside and we uh, add it to the resident sand pile. I think if that's something that we should be looking at, we should have it as an actionable item on an upcoming uh, agenda. Under like planned purchases? Yep. You mean? Is it okay if that waits until our meeting in two weeks? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, I just talked to Brian, but it was in the contract to get the 610, but we didn't. So can we make sure that's on the. Yeah, we got until, it. Wait, 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 wait. Until 610, you said? Yeah, the, that, that was the tons that we were in the contract for, was 610 tons, but we, we still can get 228 tons from them. What is the deadline for the contract? When does it expire, or does it? Does it? I think it's July, or July 1st was when it ran out, I believe, without I, seeing it. Yeah, I'm not having it in front of me. I would expect that it lasts through the year. Uh, but okay. we can, I can double check our contract and uh, have that up for discussion at the next board meeting. Uh, okay. Well, we're talking about material. I just so don't want to commit, sorry, I just don't want to commit to the next board meeting. I don't know what's on the list right now, and I don't want to keep packing our meetings like today's. So just for what it's worth. It could just be under planned purchases. Well, it's, but I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but it's our, you guys already allocated the money for it. It's not after pressure, right? It's just right. you guys want to save. Because with using the chloride, we, we were planning on saving 30%. We saved more by salting a little bit. Every time it snowed, it said wait till the snow, the storm stopped to solve. So yeah. Well, our budget was, if I remember correctly, we were at about 53% minus tonight's um, right. balance. Yeah. So I would assume that we're going to be well within our overall highway budget. Yeah. It's, this, this is, it, is a, it is something that the board had previously approved. It is within our current budget. We have the money set aside for it. It's a little bit, we're, we're bringing it to the board for input because it's a little bit different than our regular practice. We don't usually stock up on salt to that same degree. We usually use more salt than we did this year. So we don't usually have that opportunity to buy a bunch of salt at the end of the year. We think it's gonna be a good idea and we should do it. Um, but you won't see the, what we thought might be 50% uh, to 60% uh, savings on the salt budget if we buy it all up now. But we were not. We need to look at, yeah, that's a good point, Brian. I think we need to look at our whole budget and also and include it in plan purchases to Evan's point for a future meeting. Um, but we should make sure that we are in good a good position for our entire budget before we make any commitments to we're going to do it or not do it. So we'll talk about it next meeting, but it's 
a good idea. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing it up too, Jason. Thanks. Can I suggest that if you, well, did trucking costs increase during the current year or was that a locked in price? This was a locked in price. And just to clarify, I was just looking at here, winter salt, we budgeted for 42,000 and we've only spent 26 now. Yeah. But do we know if trucking costs have increased? Because trucking costs, I don't know about the salt, we haven't worked with the salt provider yet, but I know trucking costs for everything else. Like the fluoride, yeah. they raised that. The price for the so yeah. if you had some number of what you anticipate, it's going to increase. And it's if it's a locked in price, it's going to be part of their bid price. I'm sure that um, it's going to be a much higher bid. Yeah, but, that's why I, did, I was just asking, you know, that's why I brought it to you guys. Yeah. But, I, you know, at the best point, I think it's good to look at, at the overall budget rather than a single line item. Um, so maybe if Brian and Jason can come back at our next board meeting, if you look at the entire budget, is that what you'd spend the money on? That's just you don't have to answer that question right now, but you know, think about think about your overall budget in the in that term rather than a single line item in the budget. You know, have you overspent another line item that you might want? You know, to allocate some investment. Again, you don't have to answer it now, but just sort of think about it in those terms. I got to keep this meeting somewhat on time. Is there any other specific questions about the report? Uh, not about the report, but if we're done with questions about the report, we did receive a thank you card for Public Works from uh, Nancy Records on Clay Hill. I was going to give to Jason and the Public Works crew. Yeah. That would be awesome. Good job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, is, thanks for running that great. If yeah, there's nothing great. else, um, I think we're good with you tonight. Uh, if you do decide to leave, we might call you about item number five, or maybe you could stick around for it, but that's up to you. Uh, thanks, Jason, and thanks to crew for thank the crew for us too. Thank you. Next item is the Historic Society report. I thought Dick would be here for that, but yeah. Mary Jean Smith. Yeah. So, yeah. You guys can all come up if you want. <laughs> well, we're all, I don't know how this works. Work can you hear Mary Jean Beth? Uh, it's kind of muffled. Yeah, it's probably the mask. Just yell. <laughs> Mary Jean, could you pull your uh, pull a chair up closer to the microphone? Thank you, Mary Jean. Okay. Um, we're just here to talk with you guys about this proposal that we have for the second floor of the um, We've been meeting, we had a couple of meetings, um, Evan's been there to discuss options and what we could do. So just a little bit about the history. Um, when the Historical Society was looking for a home, there were a lot of proposals, several different ones, but the, the um, Colvin House stood out because um, there was a possibility for expansion. That's really why they thought of that. But um, the time has come with everything that's coming into the Colvin House and into the historical society, we're running out of space on the bottom floor. And the top floor would be the the next step for us to expand a few rooms. Um, we just need it for more storage and meeting space, displays, presentation, all of that. We still have some people on the historical site still have stuff in their basement that they're storing. So you no, know, we still have that are all in there yet. They keep coming in all the time. Um, so we just need your approval at some point to, in order to make some future plans for it. And we have a um, spreadsheet with proposals and 
I think that that item specifically is going to need to be an agenda item that's actionable. This right here? Uh, yes. Oh. I, I don't know if you got my text because I saw a picture of it and I had asked if you would email it to me yeah. or if Dick was going to present it, but I don't think the other board members have seen the no. cost spreadsheet. But I did send it to Brian and I sent it to Jack. Did you get it? I don't think I got an email from you. No, let me look. See, my emails have been down. I just noticed uh, that it's thing from being hacked. No, I, I just have to go. Okay, so I've got several copies so for you guys to look at at some point. So if you can't, but. It's not an actual item, right? Can, well, can she well, hand it out though so yeah, we, we could can. at least look at it for she some could, of the meeting? Yeah. She could certainly hand it out and we could have an actual. Can she give us a summary of, some of it right now? Or I, not that we'll act on it. Well, let me give it to you and then you can, Duncan has a lot of the information to explain it more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have it. I'll take another copy if you've got it. Keeping the loggers in business. Go ahead. Um, we're trying to make this a, a win win situation for both the town and the structure society. Um, we uh, we really could use that room upstairs, and we probably would not require the entire uh, upstairs apartment. There's part of that apartment that we could not use. We would have no use for it. It would also eliminate uh, all the expenses for the utilities. No, we would not require water. For example. We would require less electricity to be used up there now because we would have it occupied 100 percent of the time. Obviously, we wouldn't have a bathroom up there, so it would be on short energy. But if you look at the spreadsheet <clears throat> and you look at the upper three lines on the right hand side, you'll see how uh, we tried to uh, allocate of uh, the both expenses and the revenue for each of the three sections of the building separately. Since the whole building is being uh, serviced by a single electrical charge, for example, the, the the service on the electrical supplies the entire building. So we had to break down the cost of the electrical uh, utility. Um, and we did it in this way. On the second floor, which is the most occupied part of the building, we assigned 60% of the total use to that section of the building. The first floor, the historical society, uh, occupies, we figured is about, we use about 10% probably of the entire electrical church. So, um, and the back apartment, Downey's apartment, um, probably 25%, if you think we can use it, we'll go to the single we use it. We did the same thing with the heat, except Donnie's heat is separated from the heat in the First floor and the second floor apartment. So as you can see, there's zero percent charge. That's a separate item. And so that's how we broke down the cost. We took the actual cost from um, the town for, for the last year for all the utilities and the total expenses. The expense is, I'm sorry, is column B, vertical column B, and that's $7,425 in the last year we spent on um, electricity, oil, um, water, and soup. Um, so we're projecting using similar um, procedure. If you go to the second section, starting at line 20, you'll see what we have projected for use 
if the historical society were to move upstairs. So then the total cost of water, sewer, and electric, the first floor, which would be the first and the second floor, if we didn't occupy it all, would be allocated uh, a to 75% of the total uh, electric use. 100% of the heat, because Donnie's apartment was separate from that. So all oil charge. Uh, historical society. And, and Donnie's would stay essentially the same. That's the heat from the back. Uh, um, what we call the carriage room, that back section. Uh, we we charge um, the occupant the booth done at a five percent for the heat in that back, back section. Um, so if the historical society was moved upstairs, the total estimated expenses would then be forty eight hundred and seventy five dollars. Whereas total expenses as it currently is of being occupied is seventy four hundred and twenty five dollars. So we're we're saying that if the historical society were to move upstairs, um, um, the utility savings would be about twenty five hundred and fifty dollars a year. The revenue from to the town. After the historical society, so go back up to uh, revenue on 118, as it currently is, um, is about $20,000. And uh, if you subtract from that the cost, the current cost of what the utilities for the last year, you're ending up with a surplus of about $13,000. I beg your pardon. I think. Uh, yeah. No, you're right. Well, the surplus, uh, I think it's at 62.5, move to 13,000 and the 7,400. Uh, uh, however, if the historical society were to move upstairs, we're projecting, um, yeah, our total estimated expense of 4,875 dollars. So um, that would, <laughs> when you look at the revenue between the historical society increasing what they're currently giving the town in lieu of, um, of rent, would be from 1700 it would go to $3,507.50. And so the revenue, um, total revenue would then be, uh, $9,387. And uh, the revenue minus the expenses um, of, I lost my place up there. Anyway, if it's out to uh, 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 45, 12, uh, 50. reserve fund, if you will, of $4,512.50, the town would still have a plus a money. After um, after expenses of forty five hundred and twelve dollars, so um, it's still a positive. Um, the net change is actually eighty eight hundred and two dollars uh, in change. Now we're thinking that um, the the place would still have a fund. The difference between the revenue and the expenses would still have a fund uh, that would allow for maintenance costs of the entire building. If it were if it were collected and kept in the fund, we would <clears throat> we don't know what uh, what the cost. Because we don't know what is required, what would be required of us to do to the second floor apartment for us to move up there. However, whether we occupy it, we the historical society, or a new tenant occupies it, 
there is going to be the kind of expense of, um, of some monies uh, to prepare that apartment upstairs for real which is available. We are offering to share the expense of moving upstairs for the historical society to occupy the upstairs. We will share the expense with the town. We will not bear it the project of development. It's our responsibility. Um, Dean? Dean? Yes. We have gone five minutes over. Um, but okay. as long as we could just keep it, if there's only a little bit left, we can get to it. This is going to have to be an actionable item in a separate meeting. We can't vote on it today. But it is a good. Well, what, we're, what we're looking for is uh, an agreement to move people to come up upstairs so that we can move forward and uh, decide what has to be done and what the cost will be of doing it. And, uh, Forward, we don't know what position new people and the lead city has. Uh, that I guess is something that we do. Okay, thank so you. At this time, we just need the permission. I did have a question When does the current lease expire for the rental? Not having it in front of me, I believe that it is the end of May. And we have to give 30, 30 days. days notice. Yep. It's 30 days regardless of the lease, though, I believe, right? Brian, that like is an open ended 30 days. Yes. Unless they violated the terms of the lease, right? They could have violated, but uh, the lease can be terminated at any time with 30 days notice. So to, so to be clear about a couple things. One, I. Um, when I became a select board member, I resigned from the upstairs building committee because um, I didn't think it was appropriate for me as a select board member to be on that committee. Um, the I think the ask for the historical society is going to be for the board to look at the basic expense side, which would then allow the committee to explore the second part of that which is what would it cost what would the necessary permits be etc cetera, etc cetera, to actually occupy that so i think at the very first meeting we had we decided to sort of break it into two tasks one is what would the potential cost be um and then um i mean uh, what would the impact on revenues be um, for the basic expenses and then the second part would be coming back to the this board with a full proposal on an actual plan so th i think the historical society is looking for kind of a two-step process one review and review and conceptual approval of this expense proposal and then second coming back with a specific proposal to occupy. Okay. Well, being that Beth doesn't have it and these other board members just saw it. Um, yeah, is it reasonable? Is it no no it's fine. Is it reasonable to say that you guys can look at it in the next two weeks and, and come up with questions if there are yeah. you okay with that Beth? Yeah. Okay. And then get it back on as an agenda item. Because yes. they're going to have to give 30 days to notice. To make well, would they? That's all questions for the next meeting. This is a historic society report. So are there, I was kind of envisioning the talk about the damage to the parlor and uh, accepting Duncan's resignation. We asked for one earlier. Um, but we can handle those at the next meeting too. We are uh, 10 minutes over now. You want a motion to accept something resignation from the historical society? He asked for one earlier. I would entertain one because you asked for one, correct? I, I would so move. Second. Motion and a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Recused. All those opposed? The ayes have it with Duncan recusing himself. And I would like to get on the agenda at the earliest possible convenience, a discussion of Dixine's letter, which talks about making appointments. Part, part of the 99% of the reason that I'm resigning is to allow us as a select board to, to file ask the historic society. our own adopted procedure for. Understood. You were at that meeting where you were appointed too, Duncan. You could have spoke up. I could have. Um, it all happened pretty fast. If there's nothing else to report from the historic society. Well, thank you guys both very much. And everybody Mary else. Jean, will you email that document to Brian or me? Kyle, oh, accept the question if it's quick. I can. Is the whole historical society soliciting money on front porch form or just an individual? Uh, All right. What? Q. Q. I did get a response. Next item on the agenda to get back to a focus meeting <laughs> reviewing plan purchases. Uh, we have no plan purchases of over a thousand dollars. Sounds good. You heard that, Beth? Yep. No plan purchases over a thousand. Uh, next item will be the administrative report. Um, Brian, you want to take it? All right. So, first item up is uh, use of the American Rescue Plan Act funds, these are the ARPA funds. Um, as a part of the uh, a part of the process for the the ARPA funds. Um, the federal government if we are going to use the standard deduction to bring the money into our general fund. So that would be using the... Do we need to keep talking about this? Can I just make a motion? Yeah, uh, I guess if the board, if the board feels they're familiar enough with it, we can make a motion. And would somebody move. like to make a motion? I'll move that we um, submit for the standard... Sorry, what's the word again, Brian? Uh, standard deduction. Standard deduction for the ARPA funds. Yeah. I'll second that. In the entire amount? Well, for the standard. So a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I guess I would have a question, Beth. Is your motion for the entire amount? For the entire standard deduction amount, yes. Which would be due to us. Yeah. Right. Which would be 10 minutes. But we will not get 10 million. 10 million. Yeah, 10 million. 10 million. Okay, we'll work we'll plus 30. Huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, the next item, Brian. Sorry to brush you oh. a little bit. Did we have questions from the public? Okay, good. All right, uh, next up, Watts Cemetery Trust Transfer. Uh, David Marvin has been uh, managing and taking care of Watts Cemetery. It is a town cemetery, uh, but there's a, been a trust fund established for the maintenance and upkeep of that cemetery. So David Marvin has been administering that, taking care of the cemetery for us, apart from some routine maintenance that the town is undertaking itself. The administration costs for that trust fund have been rising over time and have at this point become, they're going to rapidly just 
diminish the trust fund. Uh, you know, they're exceeding, they're coming close to or exceeding the cost of maintenance. Dave Marvin would like to give the money to the town for use on uh, cemetery maintenance. Rosemary, is there any issue with that? None that I'm aware of. We have spoken to our attorney about this, and our attorney advises us that there are no issues that they see with us fully taking over Plot Cemetery and accepting the funds for that purpose. I move that we accept the funds from David Marvin for Plot Cemetery and take over ownership of the cemetery. We already own it. Yeah, we're not taking oh, over. We're taking oh, over. We're taking sorry, over. Brian implied that we didn't. Okay, got it. We're taking over the trust fund and we're taking over maintenance. There's an option. We're not take, wait, 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 wait. We're not taking over the trust fund. We're accepting donations. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, that's true. We're, we're like not taking over the trust fund. We're accepting the funds from the trust fund. We don't care where they came from. We're just accepting funds. We'll just cease to exist. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Sure. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Yeah, I just have it. All right. Next up, I provided a draft RFP for cemetery and gravestone maintenance. Uh, I think this is where you were. In the past, uh, Duncan Hastings, we, we had gone up to bid in the past, and Duncan Hastings was awarded a contract. Uh, I will say Duncan did very good work for the town, but in his current elected position, uh, we should, you know, at the very least, put this out to bid again for, uh, you know, open submissions. To be clear, I will not be submitting a proposal under any um, RFP situation. That's why I saw you laying down on a grave. <laughs> in the right? Probably. Yeah. I wonder what doing so to, to cut to the chase, I, I have been doing work on that. I sent Brian an email and I sent it to everybody earlier in the day with some ideas which I believe should be part of an RP for whoever is going to do the work. There are right ways and wrong ways to treat and maintain these stones. Um, so my the language that I included in that um, kind of specify a scope of work to be done. Um, and I would I would make a motion that the board authorize Brian to execute an RFP or to circulate an RFP and that he and I work together on that scope of work, which would be based on the document I sent you guys today. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? Is this all the cemeteries? No, no it's missing. Water is not here. Why is not Well, under my basic proposal, we're in discussion. So yes. Yeah, yeah, discussion. Under my basic concept, um, all of the stones in Whiting Hill have been cleaned. So I don't think it's necessary to include a cleaning component in the RFP if we limit the scope of work to Whiting Hill. And I would just, from my perspective, I would like us to focus on one cemetery and get it done and move to the next cemetery. So under my concept, it would be repairs only um, and limit it to Whiting Hill. Because I can tell you right now, we don't have enough money in the budget to complete the work that needs to be done on Whiting Hill in one year. <clears throat> and in, in the past, we always did whatever the worst stones were, and we're as, as far as our money would go. Um, if we focus on one cemetery, what's the conditions of the other cemetery? We never worked on, and as long as I can remember, in the last 14, 15 years, we never worked on any other cemetery other than Martin Hill. And we never got it done. Um, we, ne we never got So when I started, I started at one end of the cemetery and started working my way up. 
I started at the Route 15 and worked my way out. All the stones have been cleaned. All, so all the stones are really in nice shape and for, in terms of cleanliness. There are stones that have been knocked over, damaged, tipped, um, broken, et cetera. So my idea would be to have the contractor deal only with the broken stones, the leaning stones, the stones that need to be righted and reset. Um, and I think there's more than enough work that needs to be done in there for a couple of years of contracts. Um, that's just my perspective of somebody that's done the work in there and knows what's involved. Thank you, Duncan. Any further discussion about the motion? Uh, yeah, I don't know that. I mean, I'm concerned that what Duncan's talking about is very different than what's presented here. Um, Could you say that I, again? <clears throat> yeah, I'm just concerned that what Duncan's talking about is very different than what's presented here. Um, and what and it's also very different than what Eric's perception was about uh, cemetery maintenance historically, at least in the past recent uh, history. And so my question is, are, is this about cemetery cleaning? Is this about uh, cemetery maintenance overall, meaning fencing and cleaning and stone fixing? Like there's a lot that can happen in cemetery maintenance. Uh, so what is the scope of what we're asking for? And if we don't know what the scope of what we're asking for is, I don't think we should be approving a RFP, I think we should be working on our RFP and coming back and approving it once we have an RFP in front of us. Well, there's an existing RFP in the packet. Uh, I understand. I'm looking at it. But I believe Duncan's is a little more focused on specific items because he's done it previously. But if you'd like to. And I think the motion was to authorize. Uh, to Duncan, Duncan to work with Brian in drafting an RFP that would be circulated. Yeah. So uh, I think a minor the change could be to bring it back to the board if you're not if you're not really seeing what Duncan's suggestion is and you want some more time with it. Uh, yeah. Is that your motion though, Duncan? Is your motion to approve this with changes? Because I thought it was. Yes, it was. My, my motion was to authorize Brian to work with myself to develop a an RFP and circulate it. Okay, cool. Perfect. I fully support that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Oh, yeah. I have a list in front of me, but just some snake food. Um, I remember at one point we talked about the Mystery Cemetery near Creamery Road. It doesn't yet because we don't have a we don't have access it, to it. <laughs> this doesn't include anything about that cemetery. Or is that the official name? What's that? Mystery Cemetery? Uh, well, <laughs> it's the new cemetery. <laughs> it's not new anymore. We need to study it. That needs specific attention. That's a massive, you know, the town basically doesn't own it yet, so. Yeah, I wasn't sure where that went, actually. Yeah, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Well, I know it hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> it's not it, it is not town owned. Uh -huh. The town takes an interest because it could be, you know, there's just a lot of potential for problems if we, didn't take an interest in it, but it is not owned by the town. The town doesn't pull any liability. Uh, but we provide advice to homeowners and property owners that border that area. Or not border, but occupy that area. Thank you for the question. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Before we leave this subject, this is where I'm hoping to sneak. And the ayes have it. Um, so one would be um, 
as far as plot cemetery, last year I got almost two thirds of plot cemetery um, sprayed with one coat of wet and forget. And I can show you graphically. Um, this is a this is a picture of one that was received one coat. That's a picture of a stone that has not been treated yet. Um, so I would like to volunteer at no cost to the town um, to continue a spray application of the wet and forget to the remaining stones. And ideally to give them a second coat because you can see that even the one that was treated is much better looking. But if you look at the stones in Whiting Hill, those stones have received two coats and they look really nice. Gotcha. Um, so I would volunteer to do it. The only thing I would ask for is um, that the town cover the cost of the wet and forget product. What's the board's comfort level? I'm good um, with that. What, Beth? I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Still good good with that. Okay. <laughs> you speak too fast. I make a motion we authorize uh, Duncan to apply the remaining coats of uh, wet, wet forget and forget and a second coat is being necessary and reimbursing for the cost of the, the material. There's a motion on the floor and there's a second with Beth. Any further discussion on that topic? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Recuse. Duncan recused himself. The the eyes. For that. Do we need to do a roll call on a recusal? What? I don't think so. I was yeah. wondering about that, but I don't. I Rosemary, do you recall? I don't think so. Okay. The eyes have it. And the other thing that I wanted to perhaps get back on the agenda um, is Beth mentioned it earlier, fencing. Um, the board had talked last year about a fence on uh, Grove Cemetery. So I'd, I'd love at some point to, and that would come out of the budget line item, cemetery maintenance. Um, on the so list, got it. Got it on the list. Thanks. Thank you for that, Duncan. Yeah, I, I have a kind of non update for that, uh, that we have placed several phone calls to fancy companies and no luck. It's on the list for discussion now. Thank you for bringing it back up. We'll, we'll circle around to that again. All right. Uh, next up, discussion on, oh, excuse me, I'm skipping over Lamoille Fiber Net appointments. Uh, Lamoille Fiber Net needs Johnson's representative, and uh, there's also the time where we would appoint an alternate if we have one. Currently, we have uh, Charlotte Reaper and Paul Warden serving as our representative and alternate. They are both willing to continue to serve and have done an exemplary job representing Johnson. Uh, and both and of the Broadband. And authorizing the chair to sign. Who made the motion here? I did. Okay. Well, uh, did you too? What is your motion? My motion would be to authorize um, Charlotte Ruger and Paul Ward. There's a motion and on the floor. Is there a second? Then we you want to have uh, offer. As rep and alternate. Do you want to add authorize the chair to sign because it requires the chair's signature? Uh, that was part of my motion here. I thought it was. And also, Duncan, that uh, Charlotte is the representative and Paul is the alternate. Uh, that is what the document that I have here says. Yep. Okay. So, what's the thing, Paul, that you're authorizing? Uh, the Lamoille Fiber Net. See a resolution renewing the participation of the Loyal Fiber Net Communications Union District and appointing a representative to the gov governing board thereof. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Seconded by Mark. Any further discussion? Right. Is this something that um, Beth could come in and sign, or is Beth can come in and sign? Yeah, don't worry, I got it on the list. I'm just kind of reiterating, reiterating this for the minutes. Your appointment of our members is, constitutes our desire to continue participation in the Memorial Fiber Net CUD. 
Thanks, Brian. And thank you, Charlotte and Paul, if you're listening. Um, we really appreciate your representation on that critically important uh, board. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right. Next up is discussion on a mobile select board meeting to inspect roads. So this was something that we talked about a couple of times about getting out both formally as part of the road reclassification requirements and also as a uh, so board members have expressed a desire to get out and become more familiar with our road system as a whole. Um, we have a couple of different ways that we could go about this. I think that the good strategy would be to pick a handful of roads based on some category of interest. You know, if we wanted to look for roads that could be, you know, good candidates for changing from a class four to a trail, or good candidates for changing from class three to a class two or, or something. Pick, pick a topic, we'll set, uh, and, and we'll create a mobile meeting to address that. We can do that by once we have a, a topic, we'll identify a few spots of interest to go see. Then we can arrange a meeting schedule where we're gonna be at, you know, if we're doing, uh, I'm gonna say class four to trail because I can think of more of those off the top of my head. If we're gonna do class four to trail, we can then go say, you know, we're gonna be at Lamb Road at, you know, 6.30. And then at 6.45, we're gonna be at uh, Cotting Hall. Then at six or at uh, seven o'clock, we're gonna be at a third location. Give a few of those locations so that the members of the public can find us and participate in our discussions and then convene back here for a kind of more comprehensive meeting uh, where we can get into detail and discuss our thoughts with members of the public who want to attend it for that part of the discussion as well. Um, we would be able to pretty easily abide by open meetings that way uh, because we'd have you know, declared spots where people could participate and discuss with us. We'd be meeting the requirement of changing road classifications and uh, placing ourselves in a good position. Over time, doing a couple of these on a couple of different topics would make good use of our time and allow us to become familiar with the entire uh, road network that we have at Johnson. So is there interest from the board in scheduling a couple on-site or mobile meetings? I can tell you. I'm very interested in it. Um, I would like to go about it a different way personally. Um, I think kind of just doing it by plow routes and just seeing what each plow route is, is going to cover every class two and class three. And then if there's a time where we need to do sections of class four roads to reclassify them, that could be a separate time. Um, and I'd like if we were doing it on a plow route method, if we could get either the highway foreman to ride with us or this respective employee, if, it, if we could swing it, if we can't, we can't. Um, I don't know if that would fully meet open meeting law. I would like to do, you know, talk with the college or something, see if we could get a bus. And we have class A CDL drivers I think that's all that's needed for driving people. I suspect that whoever we got a bus from would probably give us a driver to go with it. You need a bus endorsement on your license. Oh, okay. But uh, that, if we had extra seats, anybody from the public could request to be part of the meeting. Maybe there for the whole thing. Yep. And then actual discussion on reclassification, everything would have to be here. Yes. But I, I think that we could do it that way. If we got a bus, I think that we could. It would be a whole Saturday. Probably. Yeah. I'd want to do a little bit of investigation. I think that we could I mean, do it I, that way. I think there's a lot of, not everybody on the board understands all the roads or even what we have. Even Eric told me that 
Well, Brook Road wasn't a class two. I was like, well, I think it is. Well, it is. And you've been on the select board for 30 some odd years. Well, just riding the road doesn't tell you it's a class two. I mean, you can make assumptions, but you know, if they say no, it's it is, it is a class two road. I'm just saying it'd be helpful for everybody. We pull onto a road, it's a this class road. This is. I'm not opposed to the idea at all. Um, I just wonder if it doesn't make sense to have town planning meeting to look at the town highway maps and get a better idea of those roads that we might, and, and Jason could certainly be part of that discussion, get a better understanding of the roads that we might actually. I mean, I think some of the roads that we've got, we're not going to change the classification. There's really no point. In There's certainly some. Uh, even to just inspect every road would be helpful. I think that we talk about roads all the time. And if we're going to take a plow route, that I would support doing that. I wouldn't support doing all of them in one day, but I would support doing it. Um, but if we're going to do that, we also have other responsibilities. And one of those is we spend a lot of time talking about class four roads. And if we're not gonna, you know, venture out in class four roads as well, I think we're making a mistake if we're in that area. Um, and if we're gonna do this, I think we should formally invite both whoever from the road crew that wants to join um, and also formally invite the planning commission to join us. Um, I think we all have a, we're all significant stakeholders in this. Um, so. so. I guess what I'm hearing is sort of two different approaches. One that Brian proposed was sort of a actionable item highway visit. And then what you're talking about, Evan, is a more general all of the road type of inspect every one of them, the class two and three, and the sections of four for reclassification. But if Beth wants to inspect every four, I, I have a pair of hiking so boots. If I we know. need reclassify any class four highways, we have to inspect them. Any, right. any road that you reclassify, as, as well as the public hearing and, and the whole process. It's kind of what the biggest question before you tonight is what kind of strategy do you want to take? I'm hearing general consent about meeting and inspecting some of the roads, meeting out of the field and inspecting roads. Do you want to take a focused approach where we're not even going to try to hit all the roads? We're only going to go to roads that we know we've got a discussion topic about. Or do you want to try and hit more of the roads and see a wider picture of the road system what if we what if we took the so jason i assume there's a map of the plow routes out there somewhere yep okay what if we took those maps and asked the planning commission if there are roads that tie into those plow routes that while we're in the area they would want us to look at because it comes up in conversation and then we take that information and to figure out how to schedule it out. Because I think to your point earlier, Brian, we need to have point meeting points. I think that everyone's not gonna wanna be on a bus and that shouldn't be a limiting factor. Yes, they would miss the discussion during the a ride, but it doesn't mean they couldn't follow along. So I do think we should still have points that we're gonna be at at specific times and go from there and figure out what how long it actually would take and where good stopping points are. I think without having the actual information in front of us, we're not gonna know where those stopping points are. Yeah, we, we can we can fill in the details uh, for whatever strategy, but I'm kind of hearing that the general, I'm hearing from a couple people that want to do all the roads and nobody's really objected, so that's, that's where we're going with it. Well, if the purpose is to look at all the roads, that to me is different than looking at the roads for the purpose of considering whether they should be reclassified or not. I think those are two different things. Um, well, I, I think they're, they're, they're two different interests, but we can accomplish them in one, one meeting of, like Beth's suggestion just now of, we, we picked that we're going to go on 
you know, Jason's about it. So that gives us the, the class two and class three roads that we're gonna travel on. Then working with the planning commission and our own interests, we identify what are the key roads in that network that we want to consider reclassification or have some other discussion point that we want to meet on those roads. And we schedule times where we're going to be at these different points for those inspections and discussions. Does that make sense? Well, it's also important to note that class two highways have to meet certain criteria under statute yes in order to be reclassified as class two so every town would classify every single road they had as class two if they possibly could because they get a lot more money per mile right but you're not allowed to have more than a quarter of your roads be class two and anyways, they've got so. to be considered <laughs> connectors between you know one major artery and another major artery. i mean there's there's a number of different criteria. So there's, I mean, in terms of class two roads, that's a pretty limited scope of roads that yeah. we there's were talking about. There's only seven, there's eight of them. And we would travel down all of them to get to another one at some point. Try to get to Prospect Road without driving on Hogback. Right? <laughs> Try to get to Overhill and Mine Road to Wicca Mile Road. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why they're class two class roads. Two. That's why they're class two yeah. roads. It's because they're connectors. <laughs> Do you believe we have questions yeah, or comments from the audience? So, um, great ideas. Thank you for all those wonderful ideas. Um, I was with the planning commission when we looked at the road that goes into Davis neighborhood or base road, I believe it's called. It's fourth class road. You're never going to get busted out. I think everybody knows that. And the time it took us to walk that road was a few hours. So for time efficiency, I would say leave the class four roads for a nice day for a walk. Stay on the class two, class three roads. I, I just don't see it happening realistically to look at class four roads. There is class four road policy. Yep which the board has not adopted yet. But if adopted and not amended to remove, our road foreman would trap all the class four roads one time a year as part of the policy. So he could report on any anything other than the ones looking at reclassification and I'm sure any select board member could go for a walk with him individually, yeah. which might, to your point, get back to the time constraint a little bit. Yeah. I'm trying to meet in the middle of everybody. Here. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, possibly an ETV would not open up a can of worms <laughs> for Jason to have a side-by-side -side or an ETV to actually get up to some of those roads because, I mean, my truck has got great clearance, but I would drive out there and just let's pass cash to fix right now and pop them out on some of these roads. So. Yeah, just to be clear, I wasn't suggesting we travel every fourth class road, but there are specific roads that we've that have been brought to us that I think it would just be good if we're better informed about those specific roads or stretches of road. And that's part of why I think Scott having the planning commission involved in the planning of it is important because they can help inform what's important that we see and what isn't. So I'm, I'm not particularly interested in doing the plow routes or seeing the class two roads. I think I have a good sense of those, but I'm, I'm very interested in the class four roads. I, th I think it would be interesting for us to see what's going on on those class four roads. And the damage that's being done or not being done on those class four roads, I think it's something we should be aware of. But I don't feel a great need personally to do the plow routes. And to see the class two roads, and to you know, I don't know, I don't know what that's going to do for my education to see the roads I drive on most every day. We have more policy concerns around the class four. 
The thing that's of interest to me, Mark, when it comes to the uh, lower class roads is, <laughs> which feels weird to say, is um, the roads that are like class three roads that are actually driveways. Like we have a number of them in town. Like that's interesting to me. It's very interesting to me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find one of them is Woodward Road. But, but I, don't right? know, I don't think that it's, There's I don't quite know, a I don't, we can reclassify them as trails. I, I mean, I'm open to the will of the select board, but at the same time, um, or class four roads. I don't, what would you accomplish by, by viewing these roads, Beth? What's your goal of viewing them? I mean, I agree with you on the class two for sure. There's no way that none of us are not familiar with class twos. Uh, and class threes, I think I've probably driven most of them in Johnson. I'm not sure how much I get from them. But then again, I'm just driving them. I'm not hearing it from something that Jason may want to point out or something that, you know, I just wouldn't even think of. Uh, I think that would be beneficial to hear about things that I are outside of my thought process. Um, well, I'm, yeah. maybe there's a modified modification here. You don't have to do every plow route, a tour of every plow route, but where you and Jason say these are highlights that the select board should be aware of. And I still would like to see the big map we were talking about so that I, I have a sense. I'd like to know what I don't know. What if we did it? Hang on. Are you done, Mark? Yep. Okay. What if we did a pilot program, limited scope, and just see how it plays out? Right. Pilot a, program. Pick a neighborhood. So we can, more, we can start with one plow road. Yeah, one plow road or plow road. walk one class four highway, whatever. I don't. So to get an idea of the scope, let's start. Jason and I will we'll work on this. We'll pick a plow road. Once we pick the plow route, we'll see how many points of interest are there that we want to see in that area. And that'll give us start to give us an idea of how much time we really need for that. If one will you do me a favor? Route, will you do me a favor and add somebody from the commission, planning commission to that discussion? Okay. I, yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, but we'll, we'll pick one, one plow route, we'll identify how many points of interest there are, and we'll see what the scale of it is. You know, if there's four or five, six points of interest, you know, that means one thing. If there's a dozen points of interest, that means something else. Like we, we don't really know yet what what we're talking about. But I'm I'm hearing that we want to we want to cover a decent amount of ground at the meeting, but we do want to focus on one area and the points of interest in that area. So I think I think I've got some an idea of what the I think you guys what the board had. Good general consensus. Yep. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. Yeah, you know, I just I don't I can arrange that. Thank you. Hang on, Eric had his hands up. Well I'm just thinking that maybe Sorry, you're gonna you, uh, suggest that we run this by the league also. Um, probably a mobile select board meeting is allowable under the open meeting laws if we take no action, but maybe we ought to find out for sure. But we'll get some details and some assistance about it. You know, we, we've done a couple of creative meetings that we were uh, able to clear, so I think we can do this one too. Okay. Duncan on something. I, I, you know, when I think about all of this, um, I have a pretty good understanding of our highway. So maybe for me, it's it's a different thing. But I also don't, you know, we, we hire Jason and the highway crew uh, and pay them good money to take care of our highways. I think if there were a particular issue of concern, I would expect Jason to come to us and say, you guys ought to look at this. Um, or think about this. And other than that, I, you know, I, I feel like in a, in a way, us going out and dealing with this is, is in a way stepping on, you know, the toes of a person who's highly qualified that we hired 
to maintain our highways for us. And I, I wonder if it's just a good use of our time uh, to do that. And that's just me, and if the board wants to do it, I'll participate. But. Would you or the guys or Brian feel like this is micromanaging in any way? No, I, it would be good for everybody to see what actually see what they do. I have no issue with that, and I don't know. I know Charlie Galanter at one point wanted to ride with Highway Crow. Um, I would recommend that every single select board member jump in the truck once, you know, yeah. once in the winter and uh, and and ride along with with the, one of these guys and see what see what their daily activity is like. I think it'd be good for all of us to do that. But I don't know that we need to do that as a group exercise. I guess it's. But I'll do whatever the board wants to do. But fair enough. There, there is a lot of value in, in that uh, riding with the, one of the guys when they're plowing, seeing everything that they got going on. You know, I think if I did it again, I'd like to draw it. <laughs> <laughs> you got a CDM? <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, technically, a select board member can drive us. <laughs> I think you have some general. I've got some ideas <laughs> and, and where we can go with this. Okay. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Scott. To those good points. And Jason, uh, we're good. If you're, uh, if you're good. Yeah. I appreciate you staying. Good night. Good luck. Uh, uh, he was awesome. All right. Uh, next up. The project commitment form for the Scribner Bridge Scoping Study. So, as you recall, we applied for a transportation alternative grant uh, for the study of Scribner Bridge. Uh, we want to get more details about exactly what repairs are recommended. Uh, we were also able, if you recall, the low water crossing that we were interested in that we had some engineering work done 2012-ish. Uh, we had some engineering work done in that the engineering work that we had in the bag was not really what FEMA was looking for. So FEMA did not, we ended up not going with the mitigation to try and incorporate the low water crossing and other improvements. The, landing area for Scribner Bridge. That is part of this study now. So this will be to study repairs and stormwater improvements in and around Scribner Bridge. What they need from us before they'll issue a uh, contract for the grant is a project commitment form. Of course they do. Which is in your packet. Uh, this is saying that we will abide by their terms and uh, commit the money. How much money are we committing? This is... And do we have it in our budget? We do have it in our budget. Uh, this will come up to a little bit less than $10,000. I think it's about, I think it's close to 8,000 uh, in uh, local cash match. <laughs> The days of just signing a grant agreement. We want to approve this commitment form. Yeah. I'll move that, Kevin, that we approve this commitment form as it's written. And who we going to authorize? And authorize the chair. Authorize the chair. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't matter who. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? It's ludicrous. No. <laughs> Did you get that, Donna? <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, all those opposed? The ayes have it. I'm glad we're working on keeping our bridge Absolutely. This is part of the paperwork reduction. Yes. Yeah. And then hopefully soon we will have a grant agreement to execute. 
That's something we could actually sign. That's exciting. So your next item, Brian, is noise ordinance waiver request. Yes. Uh, we have received two noise ordinance waiver requests from the state. Did you say that Casey was going to? Yes. One is for green up there, right? One is for green up there. <laughs> uh, that's the first one. There's a second one in your packet, but it's the first one by date. <clears throat> so that is coming up on May 7th uh, with a rain date of May 8th at the Johnson Skate Park uh, as part of an annual cleanup event and celebration. You want to pass these separately or together? Um, it seems like they both end at four and five o'clock. They're pretty similar, so we could do them. Did you, need, did you need Casey to speak to anything? I think that we will want Casey to speak. Beth, I made you a co-host, so if you could unmute her. Uh, I can't, let me try. Okay. Uh, the second one is uh, for a uh, is part of a fundraising effort that the skate park uh, wants to make a few improvements and extend the ramp uh, the ramp system that they have at the skate park to include a couple of new features in addition to the repair to the old ones. so this is part of that fundraising effort to accomplish that goal we will also be seeking grants and other funds or the same. So we have to at least in concept be supportive of uh, the further improvements in the skate park. <clears throat> if we're going to, or the board should at least be aware of that going on and that we don't have anything we really want for a while breaks for. Uh, I think Is Casey there and able to speak? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Casey. Is there anything else you want to say about the uh, expansion of the skate park? Uh, no, you you've got it covered. Great. I would move to approve both of the noise ordinance waiver requests as written with no conditions. Second. There's a motion on the floor and a second. Any further discussion? I'd like to say one thing. For the first time ever, I had, I had a young man move into one of my apartments to be closer to the skate park. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So there you go. Well, you, can, you can tell him how you voted. He, he, and he lives in Morrisville, and, he's, and he has a good job, and he's employed. And people like being in the skate park. Huh. What, do I, what do I know? Not much. It's the dumb boy my help. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Any yeah. further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? We have one copy for us. Yeah, it's all the board. It's all the board. It's all the board. It's all the board. I think it's just a quorum, isn't it? It only needs to be a quorum. Well, Beth can sign it when she comes in, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. All right. Next up, uh, update on local cannabis licenses, or maybe a lack of update on local cannabis licenses. Uh, I've been working with. Uh, James Pepper over at the State Cannabis Control Board, which is the, the chair of their board. Uh, we have some interest and in, about in making improvements about what we'll see. Um, and they have some interest there. So it's, it's, we have some forward movement on understanding that our local cannabis control commission needs to see something in order to approve a license. And we don't want to have to create our own set of paperwork and create too much of a burden on people who are interested in uh, opening a business. So state forms right now goes through an online portal, contains a lot of what would 
be considered proprietary information for opening a business. So it's not really appropriate for us to just receive access to the state portal. So we're working on uh, developing something for municipalities. Uh, yeah, the state is. Their timeline has been very accelerated and they're struggling to catch up. Are there any questions or anything that you have about the state of being for the cannabis control? Well, we have a great result. Yeah. <laughs> and that'll probably be delayed six months. <laughs> They should contract with the guy that developed the program commitment form. To <laughs> Do you have any questions, Beth? No. It's riveting stuff. I hope you're on the edge of your seat here. All right. Uh, next up, we've got planning for the sheriff's contract renewal. So, we, as a part of this, I just want to point out that we did put on a possible executive session for this discussion. <clears throat> There are points of negotiating a contract that the board might feel are inappropriate to discuss in an open session. So if you, if any board member feels that we're getting into that area, they can raise the, the issue. But in general, um, this is for kind of high level planning about what do we want to have in place before we go uh, talk to the sheriff about contracts. Uh, we know what the other contracts that the sheriff, our sheriff signed in our other towns. We haven't looked at examples of what uh, state police contracts might be. Um, if municipalities are contracting with each other, what some of those contracts might be. There's some alternatives out there that we can dig up. Um, yeah, what, what does the board want to have prepared in advance of that discussion? It's not just this board that makes that call. So oh. I was, yeah, I was on the law enforcement discussion with the other towns and those other towns have different boards and different chairs right now. But there was talk about how the current contract didn't meet the needs of all three towns, um, but very specifically, um, both Johnson and Wolcott had specific items that they brought up. Um, and without getting into a whole lot of detail for the reasons that Brian stated before about negotiations, um, I think that there is opportunity and the contract we have right now is a very old contract. You can tell just by glancing at it, how outdated it really is. Um, so I would like to see us with new contract language, um, but also um, I'd like to see us working with other towns too, but I'd like to see us talking about uh, the types of services we would expect in our law enforcement contract, very specifically patrol. Um, because right now there, there are a couple of specifics in there, but there are specifics to situations that happened, I don't know how long ago, a long time ago, um, about like um, pet control when there was an issue with the animal control officer and us, you know, needing law enforcement assistance or not, uh, us not wanting to pay for those hours for, for them to respond to animal control, for example. Um, but I do think that we should think about what that means to us as we go through these contracts, because we do have a new contract coming up and we do have that 3% carryover budgeting that's expiring. Um, we have an opportunity and I think we should take it. With this, Eric? Well, I guess I would just say we're running out of runway here. We should really be acting if we want to develop a new contract because that would be effective July 1st. What I would suggest is uh, our board chair reaches out to Hyde Park and Wolka, see what their interest is there and whether there would be a, a meeting, a joint meeting with the three towns. Yep, agreed. 
I agree. And I don't, I don't know that we'll have something in place with a new contract, new contract language before this contract needs to be signed again. I agree with you. I don't know if that's the case, but I do think we should be th thinking about what this looks like longer term. There's a lot of factors that will be happening in, within the next 10 years. And I think that we need to start positioning ourselves for some of those things. Mark, you had something. Oh, one of those would be ATV enforcement. Yep. Seems to, seem to want to do it, but we're paying them. We have the upper hand. Well. <laughs> Definitely a topic to talk about. What do you have, Duncan? I, I think, Eric, you're right in terms of running out of runway for the current contract. However, having said that, there may be a couple of tweaks that we could do to the current contract that would address some of our basic um, concerns. But I like your idea of the chair. I particularly like your idea of having the chair reach out to <laughs> the other chairs uh, to discuss options. Because ideally, you know, we don't all have to have exactly the same contract. I know Roger would like us to have exactly the same contract, but we don't have to. Um, but at the end of the day, he's got to sign the contract too. Um, so it's 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 not a one way street. It, it is a uh, it's going to have to be a collaborative process. Yeah, and I'm not sure about having different contracts because. It was always presented as the three towns were contracting with the sheriff in a combined, whenever we met, it was always any decisions that were being made, it was always the three towns making that decision. So could we have separate contracts? Maybe, we just never have. We haven't, and, and I know, I you remember when the animal control thing came up when the state statutes changed, and um, we really wanted to get some changes to the language, and the other two communities eventually agreed to include those or incorporate those in the contract. Um, but that's an example of, you know, we might be able to do something that the other towns did agree to that we could incorporate into a master contract. But I think you're right about the basic running out of our way for this year. Are there any other board comment? There are other towns that contract with the sheriff's department that do not have the same contract as our three towns do, and that's Elmore. Elmore contracts for a specific number of hours outside of our three towns. And it makes it a little funny when we start talking about things because all of a sudden you talk about the contract with Elmore thrown on the side, uh, you know. So again, I feel like I need to be careful about what I say in open session, uh, but I think it's something to think about. Elmore is not a equal partner. Yep. They're a, a contract for some set number of hours and a little bit of patrol and what they're contributing is going directly to offset our patrol budget costs. He's using the same manpower and uh, when there's extra time available for the, the current deputies, they go up there and patrol in Elmore and, generate some revenue that helps offset some of the patrol costs. There is a question, comment. Uh, comment and a question, I guess. So I live up on the Clay Hill Speedway. Um, and what I have been noticing, because I'm, I'm commuting more um, to go to work, and actually this afternoon, there is a state trooper parked at the AOT garage with a speed trap and right down the road. Uh, at the crossings, so the crossings, there's a sheriff's department vehicle also doing uh, their radar stuff. On Route 15? On Route 15. So it's sort of duplication 
within a five mile radius. And I know the sheriff always talks about resources and the ability to get out to the towns. But living up on Clay Hill, having a garden down on Railroad Street where I'm seeing just cars tearing it up, excuses. We don't have the resources to really do that kind of patrol very often. But when we're duplicating what the state is doing on a state highway, certainly leaves me a little bit confused. You know, would that sheriff be better off on our secondary streets or kids and folks who are running around on the roads and biking now because we have rail trails up there? Or is it more advantageous to be within a four or five mile? Distance of the state trooper. So I don't know if they coordinate their their patrol, but it seems a little weird. When I got home this afternoon after seeing that, of course, you know, people are sailing up and down Clay Hill, and there's nobody enforcing anything. And it sort of, you know, as a taxpayer writing that check or quarter. A lot of that being given to the sheriff's department. Where's the service for our community to keep our kids and families safe within the secondary roads? So I'm a little confused on that. And in the contract, I'm not sure how we convey that in the contract. It's what we expect. It's a state highway. It seems like the state police have a good handle on it. Why are they patrolling on a state highway when there's already the state police are doing it? And that was with Ed Johnson. I think they do a great job, and if it's a lack of resources, I think it has to be thought out a little bit more clearly to get the dues back to the buck. Um, the other thing, you know, out of the loop on this after I left as a trustee, we used to get the sheriff's report, the ratio, warnings, the tickets, and it always seemed lopsided that a lot of warnings were given. Within the speed range, sometimes it's 10, 15 miles an hour over the post speed, and they're just giving a warning. In other parts of the state where you did that, I worked down in Starksboro. You did that in Starksboro, you pulled over the ticket. And I drive through Jericho Center, it's the same thing there. You get there, you warrant. So with our contract, again, I don't know how we would submit that into the contract, but I think it's a public safety issue at this point. And there's just this ridiculous sort of like, I'll go as fast as I want on our roads now, even on railroad streets, where there's a, a higher population of users on that road. It, it just seems unchecked. That's all I want to say. So comment, question on that. Thank you, Scott. Jeff? My understanding is there had been a town appointed committee to review the contract and to review literally what we need as a committee, right? Or what we need as a community from the sheriff's department to start with that. Like what, how do we want to be policed? What is the extent of it which we want to be policed? And to start with that as a starting point of thinking about that contract. And the last, maybe they reconvened, but the last time I looked for minutes, it looked like they were pretty much on hiatus, long term hiatus. Um, so is that still an active committee? Is that still being looked at? The committee ran into some roadblocks yeah. um, along the way, and then uh, it kind of fell apart, and two board members <coughs> from each of the select boards were appointed. Our appointees were Matt and Beth. I'm not sure if there's meeting minutes for those because there was no forum of a No, I'm board. talking about a town committee, Mr. Johnson. Uh, I don't, I don't there think there was, was ever a member specific member Johnson, member. Johnson committee. But there was. There was a number. But it wasn't last year. No. The other, okay. No, it was a couple years. Numerous years ago. I wouldn't say numerous. I, mean, I know what Jeff was talking about. Somewhere in between it last year and numerous. It fell apart in the afternoon. It was around the time of a lot of the public police cap things, so there was kind of this thing that was going to work, I'm not going to let any of that nonsense into these meetings. That's a direct quote. Um, and then it just sort of, there are no minutes because someone went on vacation for nine months. So that committee <laughs> had members from Wolcott and Hyde Park in it. Or 
originally. Right. It was not just a Johnson committee, am I correct? I think there was I think there was a Johnson specific committee. He's talking about the committee that fell apart because somebody went on vacation for nine months. That's not actually what happened, and Duncan was on that that committee. So you're talking about the right person. It's on that committee that you're referring to, but that had members from Hyde Park, correct? Yeah, but I think and even Wolfe. before that committee, there was a local- Gotcha, a Johnson only group, one. The Johnson was, specific group. That was a ways back. That was- That was longer ago. Yeah, it was longer ago, yeah. Well, and also, Jeff, there also was a group from Johnson, and I believe actually Kyle was part of that group and maybe still is working with the Sheriff's Department on uh, racial equity and other items around training and accountability, I believe. Uh, can't see yeah. Kyle's reaction, but. Yeah, I've, I've been She's nodding her head, I believe, yes. Yeah, we're actually both on that, Jeff and I. <coughs> okay. And, but we don't talk anything about budget. Gotcha. Just about that. Yeah, because yeah. that's, that's not a town appointment committee. A that's, right, right, right. Yeah. Advisory yeah. committee. Um, yeah, and uh, you're right. It's about equity and training, things like that. I just, I, does there need to be more of a, does it need, does, I just, I think the, the, the look needs to be what are we wanting? Now, so, similar to what you were saying, like what do we want as a town? And then, you know, asking, what if the sheriff's department wants to fulfill that and what it would cost? But I feel like it's very expensive for the guy. But I also notice it's really expensive to hire good people. Right. <laughs> so so like it may just be that if we want to have patrol, and I assume we, we do. I know I prefer seeing a local police department and some of the stuff that I can have come up in my work. I prefer that over having to try to get a safety safety for up here. Certainly, right? That's an easy call. Um, but I just think like it's not gonna happen for the next contract, but we can start thinking now about the contracts ahead about what we really want as a town, where we need to be policed, and and how to incorporate that. And because I don't ever want to be bound to the exact same contract that two other towns have in terms of what we're getting for services and where and what the priorities are because we're, we're a different town. So the land, you know, the language about sort of having a patrol contract in general to share some thoughts, sure, but I think absolutely we should be able to put it to any contract with law enforcement. This, these are the priorities because if we had our own, say like village police department or town police department, you as the, as the select board would establish for them, what the priorities are. You know, you, you'd say to the chief, this is what we want, and the chief would have to deliver on that. Right? So I think we kind of leave our hands tied by not saying this is what we as a town value, this is how we would like to be patrolled and to be policed. So I think bringing something like that back, really studying it at a town level of what we want, I think it's work. Thank you, Jeff. That would be a good idea for future contracts. The railroad tracks are a little short right now. But I believe Brian was looking for input on which way we wanted to go, right? And to kind of something that everybody's mentioning, deciding a little bit on our, our priorities, what are we going to accomplish for this contract? And what are we what are our longer term goals? Mm -hmm. That yeah, we have to acknowledge that we don't have a lot of time for this contract. Um, you know, we might be able to look at a few things within a limited scope that we can accomplish now, but that doesn't preclude bigger changes in the future. Okay. Brad, will you send a copy out of our current contract to the board members so they, they can see yeah. it? Um, and I'll add a follow-up, and I think that our follow-up will be um, very specifically, what do we want to see going into this contract? this current contract for short term. Uh, and then on the, we can have something on the longer term budget for how we're going to address, I'm sorry, not budget, uh, longer term agenda on how we're going to address our approach to potentially expanding or replacing. 
the contract and get feel from other towns on what they're thinking too. Uh, I do know that, like I said, I do know the other towns are at least one of the other three towns we're talking about uh, coming up with a different contract because they wanted specific things in the contract that they weren't seeing around service level agreement. All right. So there was a motion. So I, I, mean, I, thought you said, I thought you said I was motion, but if it's a suggestion, we're not doing it. I, I don't think we got to any place where we need to go to executive session for this. I don't believe we reached anywhere where, where we would need one. All right. So we're striking tech item ten. Yep. Yeah, struck. All right, uh, item 11, uh, we'll, I want to give a little bit of a general background, and then I, I think we'll probably go into executive session. So if I have to report, I would recommend to go to executive session. So uh, the River Road East, there are the stormwater improvements that uh, we've had a discussion with the village about the proper disposition of the stormwater improvements on River Road East and how to handle those in the future. We had the problem last year with uh, the catch basin that was installed the furthest west on River Road uh, collapsed it and caused a sinkhole in our road that we had to repair. Uh, so there are there are real concerns about the the future disposition of those. There have been disagreements about whether they're the town's responsibility or the village's responsibility, what the history of those are. But uh, yeah, right now the village's position is that they are the town's responsibility. Okay, Brian. Thank uh, you. I've got a, a, an update, but I would I would entertain a motion on the board's position. The River Road East. Motion that we go into executive session. No, it's one no. of the two partners. You gotta you have to motion our position, and then going into executive session. <laughs> I retract my motion. It's our meeting well, minutes. Else to kick us off. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Scott. Good night, Scott. Can I ask a question, maybe, Brian? Um, yeah. There are three items listed here that are potential executive session items. Would it make sense for our motion to cover all three of those as potentially exposing the town to? We'll I don't think we'll can. have to come out of executive session if we go into one. And give our position on the next item and potentially enter into executive session again and then come out and can't do all three at once okay and that's my understanding so you can't go into executive session for more than one topic item you can't duncan suggestion i don't know if procedurally you want to do it this one but I think you would be allowed if you wanted to say, because each of these are two part motions where we have to find that our discussion would be disadvantages, disadvantageous to the town. I think you could say that the topic, that this topic would be disadvantageous to the town. And then this other topic would also be disadvantageous to the town. And then the third topic would be disadvantageous to the town. That's just too much. Yeah. Like I said, I don't know that you want to do it that way, but I think it would be allowed. I think it would be allowed too. But I'll make a motion to go into no. that, that by discussing this in open session, it would place the town at a disadvantage. Um, and therefore, we should go into executive session to discuss. River Road East stormwater <coughs> issues. As allowed by one. As allowed by one VSA, three, whatever. That's both of them together. 
I think that works for me. There's I mean, a, that's getting the. There's a motion on the floor. As one well. member of the public. Uh, second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? I have some questions about that. So, I can certainly call you when we get to there and you can come back up if you want to. Yeah, I'll just do that. Okay. So, uh, do we want to? No, we do want to stay up here because Beth is attending remotely. So, yeah, there's a motion and a okay. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Do you want to stay Aye. Yes. Aye. Beth? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The motion passes. I want to start putting people in the waiting room, Brian. Brian. Hey, uh, it's Evan Patch. Do you want to come back up? All right. Thank you. Bye. Did you get the 10 10, Brian? I did. Perfect. I got 10 10, and then we're switching items 12 and 13. And then I'll get notes once we start the discussion on item 13. Kyle, I, I would just recommend we wait for Kyle. She said she had some. Yeah. There she is. Yeah, my TV has not started recording yet. I don't know if there will or not, but. All right. I think you said they're recording. I think you said they're not recording. Recording in progress. Oh, there, there we go. go. Thank you. All right, board members approve switching items number 12 and 13 in order so that Kyle can say Do you need a motion to that effect, Evan? Or? I don't think we need a motion. If there's no objection. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, item number 13. You want to handle that, Brian? Sure. I'll give the introduction. Uh, last, I think it was the end, I think it was our second meeting last month. Uh, we had had, we'd seen the agreement that was signed by our former public work supervisor uh, with the, uh, I think it was VASA, not GMA. I'm still so confused that they are also GMA TV. Uh, <laughs> With, with the Green Mountain ATV Club. Uh, it, I believe it was a VAS and not the, G, not the Green Mountain ATV Club, uh, signed by our former public works supervisor, Hugh Albright. Uh, the board's direction at the time was to run by our attorney and find out a little bit more about what, what kind of liability, what kind of how binding, what was going on with it. Uh, it was, something that specified that the board had taken a resolution, uh, but the board had never seen the document before. And just to be clear, Brian, that was for improvements to the class four section of Hawaii Road? Class four <coughs> section of Hawaii Road and another road that I don't have on the top of my head. I think uh, you're right. I think it was called <coughs> Hollow. They made improvements to, um, to both of those sections, they were good improvements to the road. Um, but yeah, the, the, there was a a document that said that the select board had taken a certain resolution that the select board had not taken. <coughs> Did we have to take? Had not taken. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I would entertain a motion on the board's position. Don't do motion second conversation. Oh, okay. That's all I was going to do. Okay. Yes. No objections from the audience. Board like to make for a motion on this position. Let's see. I guess did I make it clear that I have communications from our attorney about this oh, matter? So, so I think that so we don't need position. Well, it would, I, our position would be our communicate, our premature disclosure of our communications with our attorney could be disadvantageous to the town. Would somebody like to make that motion? So moved. 
permitted by one VSA 313A1. Most second. second. That way we don't have to think so hard. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, could, I, I was like, what is this? I, I didn't know what where this came from because um, I had heard or discussed in past meetings. So it, was, um, it was in our. It was. Meetings, it was right in the past. Yeah, I, I believe it was in March. I think it was in March. I think our second meeting in March, but I can look it up for you okay. if you okay. want. But I can, I, I'm, I'm sure I uh, it is in a. If you want to read the letter, or if you want to read the agreement, it is in a folder packet. Okay. Okay. Um, I didn't okay. add it to this one because this one was more about the communication from our attorney. <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of damage control from. Yeah. It's not damage control. It's an update from our attorney. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Board entered executive session at ten fifteen. Thank you. Thank you. Put everybody in. I would move to request that Brian issue a letter to VASA based on the town attorney's advice. The motion on the floor is there a second? I'll second that. Motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, now on to our last item, which was our second to last item. Um, planning for labor negotiations. You want to take yep. that, Brian? So, uh, kind of the lay of the land last, yeah, last year we uh, engaged in labor negotiations with our uh, our public works employees as part of their, their by the bargaining agreement to join the IBEW union. Um, they, we weren't able to come to an agreement that as budget season was starting up, or we weren't able to finish our prior agreement, but they had acknowledged in general, our existing employment practices were good. So with a modification to salary, they agreed for to, to spend one year under the existing personnel policy. Uh, but they do expect us to start to meet uh, complete labor negotiations and to complete a proper first contract. So- When's uh, the year up? Say again? When is the year up? Recall, Eric, I want to say- it. November, December? I think it's November. Uh, so we've got a little while, but you know, progress can be slow with these things. So uh, we do want to start negotiations early enough. We tried to do it in the summer when they didn't have to worry about getting up for storm. Yeah. So that is kind of the lay of land. Uh, I advise that for discussing our negotiating positions, that that the premature disclosure, you have to do the motion, but I, I suggest that premature disclosure of our negotiating positions for labor contract negotiations would be disadvantageous to the town. Is there anybody prepared to make a motion on the town's position, on the board's position on the topic? Is there any specific information that we would be actually discussing, or is it much more general? Oh, I think the, the key, like the most important thing that we need to establish that we could do an open session if you like, I think we could, uh, is we need to, the, the labor negotiations last time, and I expect it would be the same, labor negotiations would be led by myself and 
uh, the town's attorney. The town's the town contracts with Stissel, Page, and Fletcher. They have a labor specialist that came and assisted us last year. So uh, John and I led the labor negotiations, but it is helpful to have uh, a board member or two present to help with uh, establishing, you know, uh, it was TA, what is it? Uh, I think that was the abbreviation, but anyway, tentative agreements. Mm -hmm. So that we can have some authority, the board can still debate, and the board may or may not adopt something. But if we have a couple board members present during negotiations, we can establish tentative agreements. If it's just myself and John, it's a little bit harder to uh, to conduct negotiations if we have no board members present in the room to weigh in on what they think the board may or may not agree. To because neither John or I will actually get a vote on whether we take up an agreement or not. Probably the benefit of going into executive session would be to discuss, this is a new board now, at least a couple new members. What is some of the board's positions on some of the current benefits, um, salaries, holidays, you know, sick time, you name it. We're going to do that at 20 minutes to 11. <laughs> I didn't think that subject to that. <laughs> we to start. We'll learn how to stop mumbling through stuff so much, and we'll, get, we'll be more focused at the next meeting. Well, we could not talk, talk about it, too. We could not go into executive session and just say, this is what we need to start thinking about. Nobody's made a motion on the town's position, but we are right here. Well, if, if somebody has specific thoughts or ideas that we should be thinking about, I'm, you know, what the heck can go to midnight as far as I'm concerned? I don't care. Um, well, I wonder if. If you're uh, talking with generalities, I think it might be more productive to make it a topic of a work session. But. Well, I, I think that, I guess I don't know how informed the whole board wants to be in advance of having a contract that we can actually vote on. We can share a draft contract with the whole board that we have right now if, if the, the whole board is interested, but it's a draft, nothing is really agreed to. Um, the thing that the board does have access to that is widely the contract, you know, widely leans on or heavily leans on, I guess I should say, is the personnel policy. And if yeah. folks aren't familiar with that, I think that's the most important starting place. Starting to talk about particulars. Yeah, Eric, do, do you think it would be productive for us to go into executive section and talk about some specifics at this point? Or I think it could be because it would provide a direction for not only Brian the attorney, but whoever the board members are that sit on that negotiating team of what the board's desire is for an outcome, or at least yeah. some direction. And, but yeah, honestly, what I want the most is to work on who's going to be on the negotiating team, who's going to go to the meetings. No. <laughs> well, I did agree that I would continue because I was on the first one, but there should be somebody else on it. Too. I nominate Evan. <laughs> Why? Because I think you'd be good at it and you care about the workers. Uh, are we going to go into executive session or not? One board member has pointed out that it's 20 to 11 and we're fumbling on whether we're going to go into executive session or not. And you've asked Eric and Eric has answered you. Then, uh, if, if you think there's value in it, Eric, I would make a motion that we enter if that discussing. <laughs> The uh, planning around the issues of labor negotiations in public might put the town at a disadvantage, and therefore that we enter into executive session 
as per VSA 1313A or whatever it is. A1. Is there a second? Motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. Executive session at 1044. Motion to adjourn. It's the only board I've ever been on where you didn't do a motion to adjourn. Huh? We still need to report, or we just get that chair of some board unit? That's why I always. I always that motion to do that. So, wait a second. We're adjourned. I assume yeah. somebody's standing up. Well, I don't All right. Come on. Bye. Bye.